Good morning, Council. Seeing that it's five after, four minutes after nine, we'll begin our meeting. I'd like to welcome everybody to the Committee of the Whole meeting of the United Counties of Stormont, Dundas, and Glengarry. Don't let me bother you, Mr. Simpson. Thank you. Uh, if I could ask the clerk to call the meeting to order. It's moved by Councillor McDonald, seconded by Councillor Laundrie, that the meeting of the Committee of the Whole of the United Counties of Stormont, Dundas, and Glengarry be hereby called to order. All in favor? Carried. Approval of the agenda. Moved by Councillor Laundrie, seconded by Councillor McDonald, that the agenda be approved as presented. All in favor? Carried. And the disclosure of pecuniary interest and general nature thereof? Seeing none. Approval of the minutes. Moved by Councillor Gardner, seconded by Councillor Wirt, that the minutes of the Committee of the Whole meeting held February 1st, 2021 be adopted as circulated. All in favor? Carried. Delegations, we have none. Staff reports, we have Mr. Paul Lenar to give us our Weed Inspector Annual Report. Please, sir. I'll, uh, I'll start with a brief introduction as uh, Peter, uh, Peter Leinar, who is our County Weed Inspector, he uh, reports through our department and uh, what Peter is going to provide Council today is just a really uh, high level update on uh, what's, what's been going on over the past year as we are, uh, uh, as, as he's been doing his work um, and certainly happy to answer any questions Council may have. It's always a very informative and interesting uh, a presentation to hear what, what's going on out in the world of, of weeds across SDNG. So uh, I'll uh, turn it over to Peter. All right, thank you. Touch this. Thank you, Ben, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity just to uh, share with you a little bit on what's happening on the weed side in the three counties. This has been year 11 for me and uh, the weeds are still growing even though at times it's dry and the weed seems still to do well. I'll just mention that uh, in this past year we've had, uh, or I've had 38 calls regarding weeds and uh, concerns along roadside or on private property. So often uh, there's a request for advice. There are times that there's a complaint with regard to a neighbor's property but often there's a complaint with regard to the roadside. And uh, the main weed issue in our area is still wild parsnip. And uh, it's uh, a very, uh, what's well, a weed that just doesn't want to go away and uh, it keeps on coming. We've had a spray program earlier in the year through May and early June, and I've been involved with uh, monitoring it. Uh, there's a herbicide that's uh, called Clearview. We've used that this year, which is effective in controlling the broadleaf weeds, but it does leave the grass. And with the virus, it continues to be a bit more of a challenge to meet with people, but uh, and Zoom obviously is working as well, and that's uh, the way it's been going a little bit more. You can notice uh, just on this slide, there's uh, a person's hand, this is a person that has a sensitivity to wild parsnip uh, and the, the chemicals in it, and uh, skin reaction can really uh, be serious. There's an individual on a bridge who's complaining about uh, the wild parsnip along the ditch that hasn't been cut, and uh, then one of the pictures shows some wild parsnip developing. Here we have another Interesting person uh, that's talked to me uh, a few times, actually initially in 2014, he contacted me and said the roadsides weren't being cut well. He was doing some cutting himself on the roadside. He was concerned that it might get into his pasture fields and he is a beef farmer. Uh, he's had a complaint against him as well from a neighbor because the neighbor thinks he's not doing enough. Well, we had a very interesting time and conversation and. Uh, that I would say the township of uh, North Stormont has done a good job in cutting here this year, but in the picture on the, on the right, you can still see some wild parsnip in the ditch, which wasn't cut, and hey, there's a fence there. The operator really can't do it all. He, uh, he can't cut every wild parsnip, yet the seed spread. So it's a challenge. 
here just a, a, a roadside that's got some of the weeds coming on. I'll just show another one here. This is County Road 31 near Williamsburg on July 14th. The wild parsnips doing very well. There's been one roadside cut. And again, people were asking me, why aren't they cutting more? And uh, I guess that's the challenge for, for the county staff. This here is a picture of a road that has been sprayed. And you can see there's basically grass there. And it's uh, been effective. This year, we had a company uh, uh, with two trucks operating and just a couple of pictures with the trucks that they were using. They do now have uh, GPS uh, monitoring systems. And in this slide, you can see the, the time of day. Uh, you can see where the operator was spraying and where the spray was turned off. If you're curious, this is uh, near Williamsburg on uh, Thunder Road, just off of County Road 18. But you can get a sense of uh, the detail that's available. And if there's ever a problem with spray drift, this is very helpful information. If some uh, field crops are damaged that uh, we don't want to see happen, but the operator can, uh, can confirm what, what the wind conditions were, what the temperature was, and humidity, and it's helpful. Uh, cutting near bridges, uh, near streams, uh, where there are rocks, it's a challenge. So uh, just getting down into the ditch, uh, it, it can, uh, you know, it doesn't always happen. One of the other areas that I've been asked to uh, just uh, respond to, it's a Japanese knotweed. It's an invasive vegetation plant, and... Uh, it's been planted as a hedge type uh, vegetation in the past. It's uh, very uh, hard to control once it gets established. So it's considered an invasive species. So it's just one of the, one of the uh, plants that I do cover as well. So just summing up, uh, monitoring the spray program. I do place signs near main intersections to let people know that the spray is happening. And, that, and then uh, I do help by picking up most of those signs. I do get calls, as I mentioned, dealing with uh, owners who uh, need some encouragement with weed control sometimes. And I uh, can write weed orders if necessary to enforce the Ontario Weed Act. That uh, basically covers covers my presentation. And if you have questions, I'm open to, to responding to them. Thank you, sir. Um, I would just take this time to ask one question on your reports, either, or the, either Paul or Ben, if you could just let us know. Would those uh, GPS reports be available to any council member that might be interested to see? Are they able to see that readout? Could you provide that to council? Um, I, I'll, I'll take that one, Peter. Um, okay. So we uh, we can request them certainly, and, and if if there's a request for a certain area, absolutely, I, we can get those that information. Um, I would suggest that um, you know if it's been a long while after the pr program has been done, you know I don't I don't I don't think there's anything contractually that obligates the contractor to keep that information for X length of time. But uh, certainly, if there's an area of interest, I, I'm happy to uh, to inquire to see if we can still get that information. Okay, thank you. There, there may be some council members who find that useful. All right, any other questions, concerns? Councillor Fraser. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, so, Peter, whenever you mention hard to control for the Japanese knotweed, what do you mean by hard to control that? There's no herbicides that will deal with that, or it has to be mechanically removed, or is it just a foregone conclusion that we'll live with it? Thank you. Uh, that's a good question, and I'd say the her there's not a good herbicide that's uh, able to control it. The rhizomes keep spreading, so it's, it tends to just keep popping up. And, and talking with some operators who've tried to control it, uh, they uh, said it's a real challenge. In Williamstown, there's been a few cases uh, near the roadsides. That's the, the pictures that I showed you. And they did do some uh, mechanical removal of roots. But then where does it go? How do, and then can it grow again there? It, like if it's at the dump or uh, some landfill site, it's possible that it might spread there. 
again, it's, it's a challenging uh, plant. Councilor Warden. Through you, Mr. Warden, I uh, just wanted to take this time to thank you. Uh, you helped one of the residents in South Glengarry uh, in the Glen Walter area. Uh, she was very thankful for your, for your guidance this past uh, year, so I wanted to thank you for that. Thank you. Appreciate that. Any other questions? Councilor Bybelds. Thank you, Warden. Um, thanks, Peter, for your, your work. Um, I have a question that uh, well, may be a bit challenging, but that's, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask your opinion, your professional opinion, on, on how the county has been managing weeds. Do we need to do more? Do we need to do less? Um, can we manage, are we managing well with our roadside uh, cutting program to, to get ahead of where we are having some challenges or do you see holes that we need to fill um, to make things better in the weed side of, of the, the program? Because I, you're right, it, it, it is a challenging field as an agriculturist. I know that you know you can't control them all, but uh, um, the roadsides that are sprayed, are, you can certainly tell the difference and it doesn't take long to get behind and once you're behind, catching up is really challenging. Thanks. It's, it's a good question, and I would say over the years, uh, I can see the effectiveness of the herbicide program, and uh, we've got to keep at it. Cutting alone is not doing it, and this uh, wild parsnip, for example, will keep coming back within three to four weeks or five weeks. It will start flowering again after it's been cut. So I would say that there's need to do a little bit more yet on the, on the control of weeds, I, as you saw in the picture along County Road 31, it, it was pretty, pretty ugly on the weed side in July. And it was August before it was cut the first time into the fence row. So I would say that that area next year definitely needs to be sprayed. And I would uh, say that we need to keep on pushing on the uh, spray program to cover probably more roadsides than we have been. Um, thank you for that. Um, I do want to see one of the challenges we have, and I understand, and we'll be talking how we can do a, either a better or, or live with the job we're doing on roadside cutting, is by the time we cut some of them in September, it's gone to seed. So That's we right. basically multiply our problem, let alone you know, what's there comes back again and we're planting the next crop. So comments yes. on that? <laughs> For sure, like we're trying to reduce seed production, ideally, and uh, it's, it's not a perfect world, but uh, we've got to keep at it to uh, get out the control before the seed is viable. So uh, in many cases, we're not getting that done, I'd say. Councillor Jaworski. Thank you, uh, Warden. Um, <sighs> Since I, I'm, I'm newer, newer to the Weed Control Act, I was wondering if you could speak, because my understanding of it is really about noxious weeds as and how they impact agriculture or horticulture operations. And so for the, in the counties, those areas that are, quote, unquote, more residential or not close to agriculture, do we have a different approach for those areas? Because in that case, the noxious weeds, I mean, I guess it, as my point is, what's the buffer distance from an agricultural area that we apply like the enforcement of this well it's a good question uh, and uh, basically the weed act deals with uh, properties that are 10 acres and more but on the other hand weed seeds can float and then where are these 10 acres or more located and how close to residential areas uh, by law enforcement can be an avenue uh, with some of the or some residential areas with weeds that are, you know, not being controlled. Um, we try to work uh, the best we can to encourage control in any location where there's a lot of weeds. And birds can carry seeds. How far can they go? They, like, how far can the water and the ditches carry seeds? It can travel quite a ways, but we're trying to reduce the amount of seed production where we can. Yep. Mr. DeHaan, you have a comment? 
Yeah, and, and I'll add on to that to Councillor Jaworski's uh, question. Uh, so with the spray program itself, like, uh, none of our spraying occurs within settlement areas, hamlets, or residential areas. Uh, additionally, um, whenever we come across uh, roadsides that are maintained as a, as a lawn is, is kind of the standard we use, uh, the applicator, even if it's identified as a area like to be sprayed, i.e. an agricultural area, if it's being maintained appropriately with mechanical means by the landowner, we don't spray there. The, the operator turns off the boom, so there's no application there. And that's, that's been our standard practice uh, since the program, you know, since I've been here at least. Yes. Does that provide some clarification? Okay. Any other comments or concerns? Seeing none, thank you, Paul. You're welcome. Thanks. We'll move on to a little spate of Mr. DeHaan this morning. So we'll start with roadside vegetation control, too. Thank you, and, and I'll just uh, preface this by uh, we, we intentionally, there was a method to our madness, we intentionally had uh, uh, Peter uh, uh, present today because uh, he's here if there is some, you know, to Councillor Beiveld's kind of points or questions that he could help provide some clarity on, he's uh, sticking around for this presentation and because uh, it is it is along the lines of the question that Councillor Beiveld's had uh, posed with respect to are we doing enough, uh, the mechanical versus uh, spray, and, uh, and then maybe looking to get some feedback from Council in terms of where you know what kind of vision do they have for uh, the work we're doing on the roadsides and if there's a different change of uh, change of approach that we should be thinking about taking so with that I'm going to throw it over to uh, Mr. Baker and I'll let him kind of lead us through this report and we'll go from there yeah so uh, good morning council and this report does uh, I believe dovetail into uh, Peter's previous report and and really what it comes down to or, or what I'm what I'm thinking and hearing from some of those questions that, that Peter received is is where do we find the balance of of how to maintain all of the roadside ve vegetation uh, throughout the county road network uh, the question of whether or not we should do more spraying or not um, right now we, we, we obviously maintain by two methods chemical spraying and mechanical mowing the spraying takes care of about five to eight hundred kilometers of roadside on an annual basis for a fifty five thousand dollar annual program cost in addition to that broadcast spraying, we also spray uh, at guide rails. That's a non-selective application. It's just to completely clear around the guide rails. Uh, in 2020, we did the entirety of the county guide rail system. There's approximately 50 kilometers of guide rail. Uh, that cost that year was $8,300. Um, there was a, a delegation that came through. Council asked us to, to revisit that program a little bit. So in 2021, we identified just the length of guide rails that would pose a health and safety hazard to our, to our operators and sprayed those. Uh, that was a, a length of 20 kilometers uh, for an approximate cost of $7,000. Uh, as far as what our, our base mowing program is right now, we maintain approximately 1,900 uh, kilometers of roadside with eight tractors. So there's two at each patrol, uh, one disc mower, one flail mower each. So we commence mowing uh, once the spraying program is completed or we can start earlier in areas we know aren't being sprayed but we have to give it a week uh, of that spraying time to last before we start mowing. So we start doing our first pass as we call it in June. By July we're completing that first pass and getting out past the ditch bottoms and, and starting our fence to fence program which takes all of our resources. The mowers don't stop turning the wheel unless they're broken down. And uh, in August, we're approximately 75% done of our fence to fence and uh, as of right now in September, this is when we're we're wrapping that fence to fence program up and going back, touching up another first pass as we call it around the, the four slopes of the ditches, getting those daylighting opened up in the intersection so we can stay in front of that first spring uh, pop up. Um, so that's our, uh, our current program as far as mowing goes. And uh, we're able to achieve that with a, an operating budget of $315,000. And that level of effort allows us to do exactly that, get around the county, once fence to fence with a, an option for a little bit of, of touch up work uh, in, the, in the extra season as, as I'm talking about this week and end of October. Um, so as Peter had mentioned, if we were trying to, and one of the questions received by council earlier this year was, what would we need to do with mowing if we wanted to control noxious weeds exclusively through mechanical means and not, and not spray? As Peter alluded to, you need to be mowing every three to five weeks, so we'll call that four times throughout out a summer growing season. Um, so there's a couple of ways that if we want to if we want to achieve that goal, uh, we can do. the The most obvious is to increase our resources. Um, in order to do so, we would need 
to first increase the operating budget so we can have the manpower and, and uh, budget available to to get that program done. So that'd be into a, an operating budget of 1.26 million annually. And in order to do that, the, the easy math is you need to do it four more times, quadruple your mowers. But if we if we use if we use leverage to for the disc mowers, the efficiency of those, we don't necessarily need to quadruple. So it's actually it results in an addition of a 20 additional tractors instead of quadrupling the current fleet. Uh, but the upfront capital cost for, for that fleet would be $2.8 million. Um, so if, count, if council was interested in kind of blending the two, and although it doesn't achieve the goal of completely controlling uh, noxious weeds by mechanical means, uh, currently our department retains uh, six temporary seasonal plow operators. So if we wanted to use that uh, resource, we could we could purchase or increase our fleet by six tractors, keep that manpower on to, to operate those machines. And although it, it won't get around four times, again, by selecting the proper attachments, we could almost double our, our uh, current level of service, so get around twice uh, in a growing season. Uh, budget estimates for that would be an operating budget of 730000 per year and an upfront capital cost of 840000 to procure the new equipment. Um, Another alternative, if we, if we want to discuss all options, would be some sort of blend of, of contracting out certain roadside sections. Um, at first glance, the most efficient way would appear to be to have the county forces uh, maintain 25% of our road network, same budget, same resources, do a quarter of the work, do it four times, and contract out the remaining 75% of the roadside. Um, it has been some time since the county has used contracted mowers. I believe the last uh, instance of a tender going out for roadside mowing was 2003. Uh, the scope of the work was much different. It was just to provide a first pass to ditch bottom. So there would need to be more investigation as to what an appropriate uh, level of service a contractor could provide, how long of a route they could do, what resources are available out there. But that is certainly a, an option that we could uh, investigate further. Or quite honestly, any combination of those of those efforts or any split of how much in-house versus how much contracted, how much spray versus versus how much mow. Um, and I guess the absolute final alternative would be we can maintain status quo as we are with mowing. And if council really does want to eliminate the spraying program, uh, we can do so as well and just deal with those noxious weeds on a complaint by complaint basis. As Peter had alluded to, I think he mentioned about 38 complaints uh, in this past year. So I can imagine that number would, would go up if we stopped spraying. But that is an option that we could spot treat those. So um, I guess there's kind of four options out there and we're looking for council's opinion or thoughts or how you'd like to, to proceed or provide any more information to you. If, if I may just supplement uh, the end of uh, Trevor's report, the, the picture you saw previously of the, the person with the burned finger, that's actually an employee of ours who, um, you know, is, I would suggest, a very conscientious uh, employee in terms of health and safety. And uh, I guess that, to, to us, that represents the risks that we face whenever our employees are working in roadsides. And that's, uh, they, yeah, no, absolutely. It's, it's a matter of, you know, wearing gloves and the proper PPE, and, and that is provided. But there are instances where, uh, even with that equipment on or that protection on, uh, how you can get contaminated with the, uh, the sap from uh, parsnip as, uh, you know, as, uh, you know through, through, through indirect contact, shall we say. Um, additionally, like, I, so I guess what we're really we're, we're trying to get from council is right now the direction we have, uh, we've been proceeding with is essentially our mowing is an aesthetic mowing. So we're doing it for the, the look of the roadsides. Um, uh, if there are instances where we can uh, redeploy resources to a deal with a weed, uh, you know, flowers about to go to seed or whatever it might be, we do that. And Peter helps to support that with us uh, based on complaints or observations he's made. Uh, the reality is we can't do it everywhere. That's just the unfortunate reality. We've got 2,000 kilometers of ditches that we have to deal with and, and eight tractors. So we just can't do it all in that very kind of short time when, when things are going to seed. So um, ultimately, the, the question in front of council is really, do we want to change change that way of thinking and get into more of a weed control mentality with our mechanical mowing 
And if so, to what level and to what kind of budget? Uh, and is this in lieu of spraying or is this in complement of spraying? So I guess with that, I, th I think that to me covers kind of what direction we're looking for as, as staff. And then we can come back to council with some, uh, uh, some additional options or just you know, more detailed kind of analysis of uh, cost for you. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you, gentlemen. I think uh, this is exactly why we're here for the Committee of the Whole to have these discussions, but I think to keep it in the most orderly fashion, I would ask the first question being, what is Council's feeling? Are we uh, good with the status quo or do we feel that we need to do more and then we can get into the discussions if it is more? Uh, we've been given four options and there's certainly options that could be created through this Council table. So I would put the general question out for a consensus. Do we want to see a change in our in our process for taking care of weeds. Thank you, Warden. I, I did write some notes down as, as Trevor in, was speaking and, and thoughts that were going through my mind. Um, he mentioned about using the temps, and, and that's not a bad idea, but my, my idea was going back to where the county were a number of years ago where the, the machine start, keeps rolling <clears throat> for more hours because right now we're not running enough hours like we're, we're running the the seven to three with really eight to two and a break in between the, the efficiency levels not there so maybe with the temps you can keep them going yeah you're gonna wear out more machinery faster but it's all about using what you have right um, the spray program needs to be like balanced I, I still believe it's the right thing to do um, if you don't, if we quit spraying within five years, you won't be able to see anything but wild parsnip in our in our uh, roadsides. It's pretty well guaranteed. Um, doing it every year is not necessary. I understand that, but every two to three years, depending on on, and that's where we had been going. So I think that makes more sense. But we need. I think as long as we're using our machinery as efficiently as possible, if we can hire people at a reasonable cost, that's fair enough. And if not, then we have to go down the customer route where they do some and we do some. And in the end, I think September cutting is too late. If you've done nothing till September, you basically let it go to seed. And, and then your job is five times harder next year. So you got to get you got to get it by the middle of August. I know that's a challenge, but that's the reality of how, how the weeds are, are hitting us. Um, aesthetically or un, uh, <coughs> sorry, or unesthetically. So that's that's my. Okay, Councillor Williams. If, uh, sorry. if I sure. just may address, sure, thank you. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Thank you for the comments, uh, Councillor Weibelts. I think uh, hearing what what you're what you're saying there is trying to get our current tractors rolling longer uh, each day. Um, so if that's options that uh, council would like us to explore, we certainly can, either through uh, means of negotiating with our current workforce to get longer days out there, or as you mentioned, supplementing with, uh, with some temporary staff that we have right now, trying to create a, uh, a second shift of mowing of some sort it could be possible. Um, there are only so many daylight hours as well, which, which does impact the, the ability to, to get two full shifts in from, from dusk to dawn. But, uh, that is a solution that we could look into uh, should council wish. Uh, thank you for that, Mr. Baker. Before I go to Councillor Williams, I will just reiterate that uh, I would like to get a consensus from council before we start answering individual questions at this point so we can see which, content, which way we're gonna go because otherwise we could have 12 separate uh, conversations going on. We need to, council itself needs to decide if we wanna change how it is you're going and then we can discuss the meat of how that's gonna work. Councillor Williams. Uh, thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, <clears throat> I, I concur with Councillor Bivalds uh, in the point that um, I, I think if, if we can't manage to get that, cut that weed before it goes to seed, it, it's, not, it's not really uh, you know, going to accomplish anything that will help us then reduce spraying. And ideally, uh, I'd, in a perfect world, we wouldn't be doing any spraying. Um, for sure, uh, but you know, looking at the numbers here, uh, I think that it would cost us far too much to to actually, you know, eliminate spraying. I don't see it as realistic at this point in time. Although, you know, in the future, who knows? Uh, I like uh, Councillor Bivald's idea of enhancing 
uh, cutting in order to be able to get that cut before it goes to seed, then maybe we can um, see some reduce some reduction in spraying. But uh, at this point in time, I, I see us as needing that that combination. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wirt. Through you, Mr. Warden, and uh, I guess the direction that I would like to support is that uh, I think that uh, uh, our administration and our staff are doing a remarkable job given the challenges. Like, as everyone knows, I farm, and when you're playing with Mother Nature, she doesn't write a script that's consistent day after day. You've got weather and terrain and a host of issues that need to be addressed. And when I take a look at the budget that's going to be before us and the areas that I think we really need to intensify, I can't include raising the amount of capital we're going to put into weed control in the in my top of my list. So I would like to see us let let our staff continue to provide the service that we're having. And uh, if it needs to be evaluated in the future, we can do that. But at this time, I have no interest in telling them how to improve because I think they're doing a remarkable job. Thank you. Any other comments at this point in time? We can get a consensus if we want to change. Councillor Jaworski, then Councillor uh, Thank you, Warden. Um, I think, like it was as raised by Council, Councillor Bivelds and Councillor Williams, I think we can probably um, deploy our resources in a bit more time-targeted manner to be able to be more effective, because as you know, was said, if we're cutting late in the year, it really has um, no effect. One thing I'll, I'll throw in here, and so some folks might not know that my husband and I, we have a certified organic hop yard. And so we don't have any tools in our toolkit in terms of spraying to deal with a lot of these noxious weeds. So we're very familiar with cutting poison parsnip by hand. <laughs> and uh, it's not, you know, it's not pleasant. And just as a PSA, it is UV activated, right? The, the, the toxin is UV activated. So if you don't expose the area that's been touched by the sap to sunlight or UV rays, you don't have the reaction. But um, I guess where I'm, where I'm going with this is, as in our operation, we often struggle with, we know that because we can't spray, we have to use mechanical means, we're using the tractor more, we're producing more greenhouse gas emissions. So that's something that always struggles with us. So I think that's something, when we're looking at a lens of wanting to reduce spraying, we want to reduce what we're putting out into the environment. We also have to think of reducing what we're putting out into the air as well. So trying to be as efficient in terms of the time of doing the work, but also in terms of our impact in the environment. And I think that has to include the greenhouse gas emissions. And my last comment I'll say is when it comes, I mean, some, when you do the mowing, I'm sure you're getting comments too, of folks saying, well, you're cutting down pollinators. You're, and, and so I think that needs to be part of the discussion too, is that I think in some cases, we might be mowing more indiscriminately than we need to be. So maybe there, in terms of what we talked about, I think it was last council or council before, in terms of having more citizen involvement to ensure that we have folks who are doing sort of more of that meticulous work that uh, well, I think would be accomplishing the results that we do want to accomplish. So those are the items I wanted to raise. Thank you. Councillor Gardner. Thank you, Warden Armstrong. Um, I uh, agree um, with what's been said, uh, started by Councillor Bivelt. I think we definitely need to have a look at this. Um, I think it might be a rejig of using current resources in a different way, potentially adding another shift, um, and also including the conversation um, around the environmental impact. So I, I, I personally would vote that uh, I wouldn't want to leave it status quo. I would definitely want to have uh, a, another look at it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else who hasn't given their opinion? Councillor Fraser. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Warden. I, 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 I agree with Councillor Wirt that uh, the status, to his comment about the status quo, but I think there's a, a change that we can uh, revisit. We've had an opportunity to discuss this, and uh, it didn't travel very far, but uh, if we're looking at options, uh, I'm going to bring up the option that Councillor Jaworski talked about, the pollinators. Maybe there's ways and sections that pollinators are, are, are supported and uh, it's uh, looked upon favorably. Um, those natural inhibitors, they, they can overwhelm. I understand uh, some weeds, I'm not sure about all weeds, but they do act uh, in, uh, in support of maybe the efforts we're trying to achieve. So the, the pollinators are the status quo, and it, it's, uh, it's, it, it's not been looked favorably at this table about pollinators. 
but I, I think there's an opportunity to look at that as a way to maybe uh, lessen the, imp the financial impact, maybe a small bit, but there's a, there is a, there is a, res uh, a belief in, uh, that I share that pollinators will serve us well. And uh, maybe there's an effort that we can make to uh, use the pollinators along with a status quo, because I do agree with the Councilor Wirt that staff's efforts are, are good efforts, uh, but uh, there's other tools in the toolkit that we have to look at. Thank you. Any of the other councillors who haven't expressed an opinion on where we should go with this? Councillor Laundry. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, maybe the question can be answered uh, by Peter. So you mentioned there was 38 calls. Uh, were they on both sides of the spectrum? Was there people that were complaining about the overwhelming uh, amount of, of uh, weeds that were out there? But was there also we had gone through the uh, we had gone through the uh, people that were against spraying the no spray areas that were also uh, we were dealing with. Now the 38 calls is it all on? trying to eliminate spraying and cutting of the weed or was there both uh, both concerns uh, the concern was, uh, sorry councillor work could you turn off your microphone sorry. Just I'm on right now. No. there you go all right thanks thanks for the question and I the the main uh, purpose of the calls was to encourage more control of the weeds and it wasn't against spraying I did not have any calls to my, uh, yeah, to, to me, uh, with regard to uh, the spray program, in the negative, uh, the, most people that I've talked with are in favor of more control, and are favorable with this, uh, agree with the spray program. Okay. So, so with that being said, uh, I think I'll support uh, Councillor Wart in regards to I think staff. Uh, there is areas where the the no spray zones are put into place. I think we've uh, aimed at that. There is operations that are. Uh, uh, not wanting spraying done, and I think we deal with that uh, side of things, but at the end of the day, uh, we have to control it. Spraying is part of it. Mowing, I don't support uh, the numbers that uh, uh, we were getting in regards of infrastructure and manpower to, to carry on with. The, so I think for now, status quo, uh, understanding what the work that our staff is putting to make sure that we deal with it in the best case uh, scenario. Thank you. Any of the three remaining councillors who haven't spoken on this? Councillor McGillis. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Worden. I just, uh, you know, I've thought about this throughout the years, and I know there was a lot of uh, pushback with the community, too, with, in terms of spraying. But I think that, again, as uh, Councillor Wirt said, that things seem to be working fairly well with the way that things are going right now. Um, if there's going to be any change that I just want to make a comment about is that... Uh, I'd like to see, you know, uh, the administration come back to see what the improvements were, how they improved, so that council, rather than waiting so long in between, give us an idea what you've done different and what, what the difference made in the consequences of doing something different in terms of spraying more. Or I just wanted to, I want you to bring it back again next year so that we understand how the improvements, uh, so we can continue with their, our efforts and how to make things better and improvement. Do you understand what I'm saying? Um, I don't, to be honest with you. Uh, I'm just saying, if we're, the if, things, I, if I, we I make just, a difference here, if we make a change, I just want them to come back next year to, uh, to the next council or the, or the council after, just to make sure, keep us more advice of how the changes, what they made, how the improvements made, the, made a difference. So, right, but I guess the question is, would you like to see some changes this year? Because otherwise we'll be maintaining status quo, so there would be no report to talk yes. about changes. So right. you would like to see some changes to it well, this year or status quo? I, I, th I would look at, and then maybe come back with a report again, uh, looking at the difference of uh, adding more hours to with our, with our uh, the tractors that we have and all the machinery that we have, and rather than adding more, have, have more staff, as they said earlier, that the, the, the uh, people that are working just seasonally, driving snow plows and things like that could possibly uh, work as the grass cutters in the, in the off season. And um, yeah, I, I would look at that for sure. Councillor Smith. 
Thank you. Through you, Warden. Um, I'd just like to um, see, I agree with Councillor Work, Councillor Laundry, and somewhat what uh, Councillor uh, Fraser had said to leave it at status quo. We can't determine today what the weather conditions or climate is going to be like next uh, season. And uh, I believe that's going to make a big difference in when it starts to grow and how fast it's going to grow. But I think if we left it the status quo, but also left it up to the discretion of public works, if they see a need uh, that a, a spray has to be done because it's getting out of hand, then I think we should leave it up to them to make that decision at that time. I can't see how it'll make a big, big difference in the budget if that's, if that's the uh, course they have to go. Thank you. Councilor McDonald. Councilor Warden, my apologies. Three, Mr. Warden. Um, status quo to a point. I think that we always need to be looking for newer, uh, newer, better techniques. Um, to Miss, uh, to um, uh, oh my God, not Tony's comment. Uh, sorry, Tony. Uh, in regards to the pollinators, I think that needs to be explored. Uh, wholeheartedly. Uh, there's a group of citizens who are genuinely concerned and I think where it can be applied it should be seriously considered. Just the status quo to say no this is our program we're we're cutting everywhere just because that's what I don't believe in that. I feel like if there's community engagement uh, where they want to take ownership it has to be explored. I think we have a duty to the citizens to do that. I think we do a good job can we do better? We can always do better. Everybody can. So uh, I, I like the idea of extending uh, um, Councillor Byville's um, comment about, uh, you know, extending the hours with what we have. I like that as well. I think, I think, I think it's doable. Okay. So collating everyone's argument, it's, uh, it seems to be reasonably tight, six to five, but status quo would be, the direction, however, with the caveat that I think we have with everybody's salient points around here, if you could bring back some of the issues uh, and uh, for budget time, what it would look like to extend some hours, we do, I think everybody would at least understand that you can't just extend hours uh, willy-nilly because we do have contracts that are negotiated and people do get breaks, whether we like them to get breaks or not. They will work at the number of hours that are agreed upon. You can see if you can add so if you can somehow within the parameters of what our contracts are see if you can get more work out of people or rearranging your shifts perhaps could could get more cutting done in a day and uh, to some of the other points you can find some efficiencies in there and bring back uh, anything you think could be attached uh, as Councillor Smith said for instance there may be some discretionary items that you think would work well and give us an overview like that but, but uh, essentially the group is saying not no real substantial changes to the, to the status quo, but there can be a find efficiencies within the framework that are already there. Is that clear enough? And let us know what budgetary impacts that could be. I, th I think for, from from staff's perspective, I'm going to talk, and I'm I'm, I'm going to guess Trevor's going to agree. Like, well, for us, it's very helpful to have. Uh, an understanding of what that like targeted level of service is. So the original uh, comment brought forward by Councillor Bivelds, which I, you know, I'm going to look to Peter. You can either shake your head yes or no. Like ideally, if we have a cut done by the middle of August, that that is a way to, you know, do a better job at trying to suppress weed um, propagation. Is that fair? Middle of August or beginning of August? Like I kind of had in my head. That's what I would have, that's kind of just my observation would be beginning of August. So I'm hearing that that's not the case, but there's a desire to see the tractors running longer. So ultimately what may be my question to council, is there a targeted, like by having those tractors run longer, are we trying to have, you know, all our roadside mowing done by the end of August and then we put the tractors away at that point or do we continue to have the tractors going? Uh, because, like, you know, if... 
you know, very, very basic, very basic kind of budgetary math here. Um, if it costs us three, what was 315 to mow all our roadsides the way we do right now, we could try and do that sooner, but are we sticking with $315,000 as a budget or is the expectation that we're coming back at budget time saying, if we, you know, we can create these efficiencies, we can keep going to the end of September, but it's going to cost $450,000. Is that, well, that's, I th that's yes. kind of what I'm trying to get an understanding of. I think very clearly we heard that September is not acceptable. And, and to that point, uh, from what I would hear from Councillor Bybelds and from some of the other people that know intimately, if we're going to be cutting September, then we might as well not be cutting because that, that money is not what would be considered good money. You're throwing it away because you're too late. So there's no sense in doing that. So an earlier target, to Councillor Bybelds' point, to get so that our last cut is not in September. It's before they've gone to seed and, and we're not propagating the crop. For, for argument's sake. Um, Budget-wise, it doesn't seem like there's a, a much will to put a lot of more dollars in, but I would suggest to you, in just my opinion, if you were to be able to come up with some of the efficiencies that people have targeted where they find um, uh, that we're lacking a bit, and it's not another 100 or 50 or $2 million, whatever ridiculous number, if it's something within a, a normal parameter, you could bring that forward and say, this is what we can accomplish with 50,000 more or 100,000 more. I wouldn't go much more than that. And we can hit the timelines that have been expressed. We will no longer be cutting at the end of September so that we're not letting them go to seed. If you can capture that and show us what it would look like, I think you're, you'd be on the right track. So, I mean, council has expressed that they're looking for you to use efficiencies to, to take a look at that, the, the status quo and the, the methods in which you're doing it and see what you can do for longer hours. See, see if there's any way that you can attach a better use of our time and eliminate cutting in September. So if I may just request a, one last clarification on that uh, matter. Is, is, is council then opposed to an increase in the spring, spring program? Because my understanding is the, the late September cutting is not an issue of visual impact on the roadside. It's to get the plant before it goes to seed. So by increasing the spraying program, then we're just cutting grass at the end of September. We're not cutting weeds, is, is the question. Are we, are we trying to come back with options strictly in mechanical means, or are we looking at spraying options as efficiencies as well? Because it's obviously much cheaper. Well, the contention that no one disputed at this table is that if you, and we have a, a person, in my opinion, because I, I would be at the low end of the knowledge of this, but I do consider Councillor Bivolts to be somewhat of an expert in, in what he does for a living and, and runs his business, is contending that, that in September they're going to seed and there's no real point in cutting it. So there's no real point in spending that money. And I didn't see anyone else disputing what Councillor Bybelds was saying. So I'm, I'm in agreement with him. So we should be, if someone wants to dispute it, that's fine. But we should not be doing something that is wasteful, which is cutting in September. And Councillor Bybelds said it and no one disagreed with him. We have other agriculturalists around here. So, yeah, why are we cutting in September? There's an efficiency right there. Councillor Bybelt. Thank you, Warden. Um, I don't want to real. I think it's that balance. Like, you know, there's area, like, okay, so South Dundas, I'm just going to take what we do, and I'm not trying to compare it to the county because the county's big. I understand that. But we cut, we spray half and half. That's the program right now. And in doing so, the parsnip along the roadsides is very minimal because of that. So we're spraying more. We only cut once. Everything gets only cut once. Yeah, we only have a little bit to do, except for the, you, you know, you got to do the, uh, the first pass again. That, that September cut is you got to do it or else it's going to be dealing with snow and, you, you know, it's going to hold snow back. But to say you can do it all with just spray, you just spray it and don't cut it, I don't think that there's a balance there. Uh, if you cut it early enough, it comes back, it looks nice, it's, it's that balance that, that works. And if we don't, if we get behind in cutting, and some will say, well, everything looks good, but your county got cut before South Dundas or whatever, and then all of a sudden, you know, down to this end, cut it, everything along too got cut in September. And you can tell, it's too late. Um, you can't be everywhere anywhere. I understand that, but the September thing doesn't work, and I think the efficiency of running those mowers a little longer, not not to sparing our, our current employees, but 
you know, running another four hours or eight hours, well, you can't do eight hours, but you know, whatever works. It, you've done it in the past, it's not like you can't do it again. It will help, and in September, you just do that one pass and you're done. Find something else for the guys to do. I know you, you know that's that dead area, and it works, but if you don't cut it, the agricultural community is gonna start talking to us saying, why aren't you cutting? I just landed up purchasing more roadside from County Road 7 to 7th Concession of, of Williamsburg, so now I'm looking at more too, and I, I that's a, from a personal point of view, but I'm not the only agriculture out there that doesn't want parsnip or even other weeds start to flow across the field because of prevailing winds. It's, weeds are becoming more an issue on agricultural fields. If you drive around, you'll see soybean fields are just contaminated this year. Our fault, not your fault, but we don't want to make it your fault. Let's try to balance it out. That's my professional opinion, Mr. Ward. Councilor Fraser. Uh, thank you, Mr. Warden. I just wanted to uh, uh, make clear that um, I don't want to speak for everyone else, but my contention is the status quo, which I think is quite different than what uh, uh, Councillor Bybell is proposing. Uh, just for clarity, whenever there's no, whenever you say that uh, everyone was in agreement with uh, some of the things that Councillor Bybell is contending, uh, I'm not. Uh, I'm thinking there's the status quo, but my comment was the status quo, which is continue doing what we're doing, but if we have options that are different, and as I suggested, pollinators is one, and there are other options that were were, were uh, discussed and brought forward by members of council. Um, I just want to be clear on that when it goes out to the public about this, that I'm not supporting exactly what Councillor Bybelt is saying. I'm supporting what I was contending. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I do have, I had written down beside everyone's name where they were at. The majority does want the status quo. I would just suggest that you can look at finding efficiencies within the status quo or enhancements, nothing too radical, but see if there are ways in which you can arrive at the status quo, but even more efficiently, for, for lack of a better term, or some small add-ons that are not changing the world, but but you know, just, just like we try to improve every single year, we can see if there's a different approach to, and I know that's an oxymoron, but a different approach to the status quo. You could possibly get a few more hours in, in August, for instance, so that we don't necessarily be cutting any one of the townships in September when it's gone to seed. We're a little bit earlier, or things like that, where we can avoid some of the pitfalls, but the, the will of the group is to maintain status quo. So see if you can find some things to add on or else you, you've got your direction at least for status quo on this. Yep. Thank, thank you. Just okay, and that 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 sounds uh, good. So we will, from a uh, kind of from our targeting perspective, and I'm just kind of going to put it to how we're going to think about it in terms of coming back with, you know, if there is minor budget implications to it, we're going to be looking at okay, how can we improve efficiencies at minimal cost to attempt to finish our, we'll call it fence line to fence line mowing earlier in the season. Uh, ideally, let, well, I'm going to give a date, August 15th, let's say, um, and then after which our target after that fence to fence is still just one time around it, with the final kind of mowing at uh, like the one pass mowing. Um, and and we'll try and t to do it that way as well as look, working with Peter, look to enhance our spraying program to help continue to suppress the weeds until we're at that point again through our next weed audit that we can potentially go back to, uh, you know, something lesser than. So uh, does that, am I... I yeah, I For me, I it's that I August feel like I'm trying to pick a date when we're trying to be done by so that at least then we know how we staff ourselves and what we need to do in terms of talking with our, our staff or, or hiring supplementary staff to achieve that goal. Yeah, I, 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 perhaps I'm making it convoluted, but I don't think it's that difficult, Mr. Don. Uh, you know, the, the, the status quo is what the bulk of the group would, would allow, and I'm going to allow Councillor Williams to speak in a moment, but... Um, there is some contention that is not being disputed that September is a little too late as far as for taking care of the weeds, but not the cutting. So it's just a small tweak that you could that you can incorporate it, and the rest of it, you're going to keep the status quo. Find see if you can find a way, and if you can't, you can't. I mean, it's it's not that big a tweak, really. Everybody's asking for status quo. The the, the majority is asking for status quo, but there has been a concern 
tabled about the September cutting for the weeds. As you know, again, as Councilor Breibelt said, you can still cut for the grass. You don't have to stop cutting, but targeting the weeds perhaps a little bit earlier. I don't think that's that big a tweak that you can't come up with something for us. Councilor Williams, I'll give you the last comment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, I, I think you've hit the nail on the head there with where you're going. Um, <clears throat> I heard four um, councillors speak to their interest on the pollinator issue and involving, uh, you know, community interest in our roadsides. Um, I know that this came in front of council a while ago and got dumped somehow, I'm not sure, but um, uh, I'm, I would make five. Uh, I, I would be interested in hearing a little bit more. Uh, I'm assuming it wouldn't have any significant budget impact, but I do believe it is worth further discussion. Yes, Mr. Dahan. Yeah, I'm happy to, to, to comment on that. We, we actually did make a commitment to come back to Council with an adopt a roadside program. And I can tell you, I think it's today, one of our staff members is actually touring Lanark County where they're doing, a, there's a, actually like a, a show and tell happening in Lanark County for this exact program. So like that's been our intent all along and, and this kind of uh, staff, um, staff education is going to help inform that. So that, that is returning back to Council and, and uh, I think you'll, we'll have a better discussion at budget time because there are, you know, again, minor, minor budget implications if, depending on what kind of involvement we have. But our intent is to have an adopt a roadside policy available for Council to mull over in the near future. Thank you. All right. We'll move on to signage on county roads. Okay, so moving on to signage on uh, County Road Network, just uh, start off with a couple of uh, quick facts of what we're dealing with out there in terms of signage. So uh, we have an inventory of our signage that's warning and regulatory only, and we'll get into the, what those types are. Uh, but we have an inventory of 7,300 approximately across the County Road Network, and that uh, asset alone is worth about $800,000, and that's just the materials. That's not uh, counting the cost it takes to, to get them in place. Uh, our 2021 signage budget, so that's all of our replacement uh, signage is $202,000 and when we start looking at some of the the types of signage uh, further on this report these numbers will come into play but the uh, the amount of intersections on the county road network just not just shy of a thousand so when you think about that it's almost one per kilometer and then just broken down a few other ways there for for information uh, our county road network so this is a map here uh, depicting the road class by the minimum maintenance standards and uh, I can come back to this for information for, for Council's consideration in the future, but it's really just to highlight that. You'll see uh, former highways on there. Uh, a lot of them are Class 2, uh, Class 3, but also highlighting there are some Class 5 sections of former highways, as well as many other county roads that are Class 3s that are not former highways. Uh, so types of sign out on the county roads, there's your regulatory signs, yield, stop, you know, maximum speed, the ones that are, are enforcing the laws of the HTA. Your warning signs that are, are giving you advance notice of hazards that may be there, whether it's wildlife uh, in the area or road geometry hazards, curves, slow down, stop ahead, et cetera. Uh, your temporary conditions, your normal detour signs, uh, or if there is a, you know, a, a frost bump that, that adheres, you, you're putting that orange signage out for temporary conditions, emergency closures. And then what a lot of the meat of this report deals with is the guide and information signage. So that's your, your wayfinding signs. Anything that's information for the road user. It's not, uh, it doesn't impact the safety of the road or the laws of the road. It's strictly for information purposes. Um, under the county uh, sign bylaw, which governs all the signs uh, in the right of way, private, public, etc., cetera, uh, road signs installed by the county are considered official signs. However, there is a provision in there for other official signs to be installed, whether it's by uh, community groups such as the Neighborhood Watch or the local municipalities for the, uh, the, the Jake brake signs, engine brake signs, uh, well protection zones from uh, conservation authorities, etc. Those are all allowed to be placed in the right of way as well and are considered an official sign. Uh, so the signs that the county does install are installed in accordance with the Ontario Traffic Manual, and that really tells us it's very specific as to what should, shall, or must be done. And each type of sign, as, as mentioned 
uh, the types before, has its own book uh, of the OTM, specifically dealing with that classification of sign. Each book has its own chapter on each specific sign. So there's a chapter just for stop signs. And that's going to tell you the, the purpose and the background of the sign, the types, the sizes, the colors, what reflectivity it has to be, where to use it, when to use it, when not to use it, where to place it, uh, what its legal status is. Is it enforced through the Highway Traffic Act? Do you need a bylaw to back it up? And then there's special considerations for, for certain types of signs not to conflict with, with others, so it'll reference you to another chapter. Uh, so as far as regulatory signs go, they are intended to instruct the road user what they must do under a given circumstance. Example, pull up to a stop sign or an intersection, stop. Max speed is 50, that's it. Uh, they're enforcing the laws. Uh, and if you don't, you can get a ticket. Um, so therefore, because of the severity of those signs, your ability to have any sort of discretion and, and interpretation on, on what OTM says is very minimal. They're, they're very, very prescriptive in what they, what they say needs to be done. And therefore, our recommendation is we just maintain the status quo on regulatory signage in the right of way. Next on the list is warning signs. As I mentioned, they provide notice for hazards that are out there, not necessarily against the, the law to keep going on through that deer zone or, or that advisory tab on a, on a curve that says, you know, this one's 60 instead of 80. It's, it's not legal, but it's a very good warning to the driver. This is what needs to be done in this section of road. Take caution. Uh, because the nature of the signs, there is some more discretion available. I said, you know, it's a limited discretionary ability. Um, a lot of times it says, you know, if there is a uh, bump ahead, it must be placed, a, you're signed a minimum 230 meters, let's say, but there's no real maximum. So there's some discretion there. If 230 is right in the middle of somebody's driveway, well, you go 240 kind of thing. So you can, you can play a little bit with the, the warning sign uh, stipulations. Um, a big thing that, that we've noticed is um, as, we, as we conducted our inventory, that was attained through checking the reflectivity of the, of the signage, which is a requirement under the minimum maintenance standards. Uh, so we have a, a great inventory of what signs are where. And we want to continue to just kind of review the warrants of those signs that are in place. It's, it's, it's obvious to, to staff, and, and uh, if you look over the years, there's just been a bit of a creep of some over signage, or maybe something was put in with the best of intentions, but it's not exactly warranted by the OTM. So we'd like to, con to review those warrants as we review our inventory, which could, re could result in the removal of some warning signs. Uh, so guide and information signs, as I mentioned, they're to aid road users in reaching their destination. They're not expected to be rel relied on as the sole source of information on a roadway, but they're to help you get where you're going. And there's various types throughout the county road network. Uh, pictures here of what we refer to them as uh, colloquially is uh, fingerboard signs there, uh, you know, as the advanced notice of a, of a road coming up, the blade signs right at the intersection, and the wayfinding or direction boards that are pointing it towards points of interest or settlement areas. So in recent years, staff had stopped replacing the fingerboards on the former highways, and we were, we were trying to get some uniformity across all, all the road network. We weren't ever receiving complaints that those signs didn't exist on, on other sections of road, so in order to get everything into order, we figured we'll, we'll bring the, uh, the former highways into, uh, into our current standard that's across the rest of the county. And the rationale for not replacing that is that the former highway is not an official road class by any, any notice under the MMS. And in all other maintenance areas, those former highways get the same service as their similarly classed roads. Uh, council expressed their desire to see the fingerboards replaced and requested that we come back with this report. So here's where we're at today. And so you can see here an example from uh, Google Street View, uh, former highway, now County Road 2, uh, marked with a, a directional board, uh, no indication of County Road 12 or Wales Road approaching. This is 2019. If I go on to 2009, you can see the direction board does note uh, County Road 12, Wales Road. So this is kind of a cleanup that has been going on for some time, but uh, it was uh, noticed to, to maybe council wishes to go back to that desire of, of highlighting all roads in advance of the intersection. Uh, so when it comes to the discretionary ability for guide and information signs, the OTM is, it states that they prepared it based on the underlying assumption that the principles are there for provincial highways, but in general, they should be able to be adapted to a municipal, municipality's use as they see fit, given their environment and roadside, et cetera. So long story short is there's a, there's a much more discretion available and county council can decide how they wish to proceed with information signs. 
so in terms of intersection signage, there's options provided here. Option one is to install the road name signage exactly per the full recommendation of the Ontario Traffic Manual, which would be a sign at the turnoff, which is 30 meters in advance of the intersection, plus an advanced sign, which is 500 meters in advance of the intersection. Uh, the signs are uh, uh, 600 uh, millimeters high, so 24 inch signs. They'd be on two six by six posts installed at those locations. They're required by the OTM on all roads with a speed limit greater or equal to 70 kilometers per hour. As I mentioned, their placement. Uh, estimated cost for this type of installation would be $2,300 per intersection uh, for a total estimated cost of one, about 1.9 million. And that's going back to those intersection numbers uh, previously provided. So uh, this, this option is not recommended by staff, uh, obviously partly, partly due to cost. And due to the conflict that would occur with the spacing of the intersections, it would be very difficult to get those 500 meter advanced signs without having another intersection stuck into place. So you'd have all these staggered signs and you really wouldn't know which road is which. Am I between the advance and the turnoff or is this the turnoff for the one I'm at right now? It we believe it would lead to uh, driver confusion. So the second option is a, is a qualified option from the OTM. That recommendation uh, that I just discussed is got an asterisk beside it and they mentioned that if the approaching roadway is a single lane stop controlled, one, one low speed roadway identification sign on the far right side of the intersection may replace both those other signs. So it'd just be a single sign at the turnoff, uh, 600 mil height. Approximate cost there would be 1200 per intersection, uh, estimated across the county at 1.05 million. Uh, this option is not recommended unless council wishes to adhere to the, the uh, intent of the OTM. And as I mentioned, there's, there's uh, more leniency with the guide information signs. So option three at council's hand is to create uh, a custom policy that could look something uh, as illustrated here. In the rural areas, it would be a, what we refer to as a fingerboard sign in advance of the intersection, uh, giving that, that local name, uh, intersecting name, with a blade sign at the, at the intersection marking the county road uh, number. In urban areas, it would be uh, no advanced signage, no fingerboard, but having both the county road number and local street name at the intersection itself. So if there is a desire to maintain those fingerboards, uh, staff would recommend uh, doing so in the following manner. Uh, installing at the OTM distance of 30 meters uh, of all county road intersections where the speed limit is greater than 60 kilometers an hour, and what that does, it gets us outside of those settlement areas. Uh, in, those, in those areas, we would install the blade, blade sides in lieu of fingerboards, where the speed limit is less than 60. We, we would use green signs with white lettering for all the blade signs, uh, fingerboards, wayfinding signs, etc. And where the county roads are recognized with a local name, the fingerboard would have the blade sign with the county road number and the local name. So, for example, County Road 12, Main Street. If the municipalities wish to enhance the local signage, uh, getting decorative or any sort of those downtown areas or whatnot, they can do so. It would be at the municipality's cost, which is very similar to the Hamlet signage program right now. We provide the, the base signage, but a lot of the municipalities have the enhanced Hamlet signage, so we would follow a similar uh, program for, for this type of signage. And we suggest that the implementation, implementation be phased in as the signs are needed to be replaced, so in order to try and do it as efficiently as possible. Uh, if implemented, this as recommended, maximum cost would be $871,000, which is approximately $1,000 per intersection. Uh, some options to consider if staff or if council wants to tweak this recommendation, we could apply this, we're talking about applying it to all county roads, we could apply this uh, only to certain road classes, class two and three for example. We could apply it only on the former highways if that is uh, Council's desire, we can set a deadline when we want to get it done and instead of just putting it up when uh, the signs are warranted. And we could also include those metal blade signs at all intersections, even if the fingerboard is present, if, if that's what Council would like to see. So, uh, as noted in the report, sorry, I clicked the wrong button. Uh, there's also a couple of unique instances across the county, and one that's in interesting, uh, is in South Dundas, there's a wild uh, animal highway warning reflector system you've probably seen if you've driven down County Road 2, uh, right near the, uh, the golf course down there, Alt Island Road. 
approximate length of 3.2 kilometers along the road, and it's those red uh, reflectors you can see on, on the stakes. And the idea is there is it, it bounces the headlight beams off and is a, a deterrent for deer uh, coming across the road in that location. So this project was initiated in 2001 between the OPP detach, local OPP detachment and three private insurance companies at a cost of $27,000, which would be equal to $40,000 today and today's dollars. Uh, the historical ac accident reports that we receive from the OPP don't indicate that there's any great variance in amount of deer collisions in this area, but it's, that's just one stat that's hard to, to say. Is it because of the reflectors? Is it not? Um, it's hard to, to put it solely on those markers. But uh, anecdotally, staff observe that when they, we do get called out there to pick up any roadkill, it seems to be at the end of the markers. It's not in the middle of that stretch. So uh, you, know, you, would, you would assume that they are working as intended, uh, especially considering that's in the area of the bird sanctuary, which there's you know, quite, a, quite a good dense bush through there. There's a, a healthy deer population from, from what we understand. The markers do impact the roadside maintenance, the mowing. It's, they're, they're every 18 meters apart, so you're up and down, in and out and around them. So there is some, some loss there of, of productivity, um, but they also may be working. So the, the question for council to consider at the end is, is do we want to maintain that installation and, and, and bring that back up to standard, or do we want to rely solely on the warning signs for deer collisions in that area if they're warranted per the OTM? Uh, as I mentioned, we want to review the warrants for signs, and part of it is, is finding a balance of what's, what's the appropriate amount of signage out there, and you'll hear sometimes you know, about sign pollution. There's just so much out there that you can't see the one you were looking for. And it's to find a balance of what's required to provide a safe roadside without creating distractions, and that's why we need to review the warrants of it. And as the OTM states it, it's, it's in order to retain the public credibility of all traffic control devices, the consistency and application is necessary. Uh, insufficient warning signage may leave users unprepared for encountering hazards, but if you have too much signage, they may just get complacent. Oh, I've seen that one before and it was no big deal. Um, so where we talk about reviewing the warrants uh, and being possible to re remove some warning signs, uh, just a couple of examples there for council to, to see what we're talking about. Uh, some curves where there's chevrons in place, but also that checkerboard signage. Well, the checkerboard signage is, is intended for an abrupt end of road that you may see in your townships where it's a, a T. There's no other way to go. Uh, on the far right, it, there's just a checkerboard sign with no chevrons. So we'd like to, to review that and make sure things are signed appropriately out there. Out there. The stop ahead sign is to be used when you can't see the stop sign from X distance, but you'll see here in that middle picture, there's a stop ahead with a, a perfectly clear sight line to that existing stop sign. So those are a couple of examples of warning signs that may be removed uh, if we go you know, strictly to the OTM warrants to provide that consistent level. So when someone sees a Chevron, they know I have to slow down for this curve. It's not a false warning. Uh, so uh, staff are looking for your input as to what kind of standards you would like to see out there, particularly in, in regards to the ro uh, guide and information signs. And once we have a good understanding of that, we can come back with some policies and budgets of what it would take uh, to detail to implement that. All right. Not much to unpack there. Council comments, questions, concerns? Mm -hmm. Councillor Jaworski, then Councillor Bywolds, and Councillor Gardner. Thank you, Warden. Um, so we in, in South Glengarry, we have a, we've recently um, created a, a signage policy, and so we have a design um, indicating the township, the the, the hamlet, and we're pr currently having a citizen engagement thing where we're having people vote on what's like the image, the, s the smaller piece of it. They'll be very individualized for that community, and I'll have our tagline saying Ontario's Celtic Heartland. And I know that we were in discussions too with the counties on how, what's an element that we could incorporate into that hamlet signage to sort of reflect, you know, that the, we're part of the, the larger SDG. And so I'm just going to comment on the, the guide and information signs. I think, I mean, and perhaps I'm way off base. Maybe you're going to tell me, no, they have to be those green signs. But I would say that those are an opportunity to make them a little bit more elaborate and really an opportunity for branding, an opportunity for having a cohesive look for SDG that is somewhat unique and not exactly the same as what you find everywhere else. So this is really, I would think that, that that's my suggestion to that is I think I think the option three is good I in terms of the options you've presented but I think 
use option three as an opportunity to improve SDG branding overall. Thank you, Councilor Bybelt. Thank you, Warden. Um, I was the one that brought this initial up uh, issue up when uh, the signs were disappearing, mainly along the former highways. And I guess it sounds like the county staff would like to get rid of that moniker, but I think there's not enough generations gone yet to know that the highways didn't exist at one time. Um, now, I understand that you know using the OTM as 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 your basis is good, and you know it's more a guide than the law. And I, and I don't have any issues with the regulatory ones; they they make sense. And you know you got to have them, and, and the more the better, because if you're uh, looking at it from a liability point of view, also, then uh, having no sign and somebody going off a curve is not a good thing. However, I'm not here to, to try to treat every road in the county the same. We have roads that are are class two and three for a reason. They're they're more populated. They're more more traffic. Uh, most of the time, higher speeds. Um, they were they were the ones, especially the old highways, as I refer to again, where the fingerboards were and started disappearing. Um, I'm still in the opinion that the fingerboards are important for those who. Uh, are not from our area and need to know where they're going. Um, there's nothing worse than somebody seeing, oh, there's a blade and hitting the brakes, not thinking of what's behind them. And yes, the person behind them is responsible for stopping, but um, sometimes they can't make it and it can cause, uh, has potential to cause issues. So um, I, I wouldn't go to the big ones. The fingerboards were good. Um, I still, if I was going to add any other signs in, in, the, uh, in the county, it's more to county to county road junctions, especially the ones that become dual designated. So you know that you're coming and I'll, I'll go to 818 uh, or eight, eight, even 18 and 1. You get to the West End and you don't know where 18 restarts because you're going through Glen Stewart and, oh, I missed 18 because I didn't know it was there. And most of the upper tier counties do have those signs. I go to Lan Leeds, Grenville enough, and they still have those signs there. So, you know, it's basically having our sign saying a directional or, or something like that. So it's, it's not the big board. It's just saying, you know, SDG 8 and then an arrow that you're going to be turning there. You can turn there. Um, and the blades that you talked about putting the option of putting blades on on the stop signs i still think that's a um an added feature that uh is still important and should be done i think they're there now but um i think coming up with a, I, I don't want fingerboards everywhere as you're proposing necessarily now if county council wants to go down the way that way that's up to them but i think in the two three roads are the ones that are most important and where traffic uh hazards and and people looking to where to go are, are important. I don't, we don't need signs. We know where we're going. It's the visitors that come in, the truckers that come in, those are looking, where am I going to go? And all of a sudden, oh, there's the sign. Now I know I got to slow down. Or uh, that's where I want to go to that tourism attraction. It's, it's that combination that we have to think about. We have to think beyond us. We have to think of those who don't, who don't live here normally. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bybelts. Um, the only issue I would take, I think, is that you perhaps haven't driven with Councillor Fraser enough when we're going to say that we know where we're going. You should have him take you for a little trip, perhaps. You know, the SS Minnow had less lost time. Yeah. Well, if it hasn't happened by now, it probably won't. Um, any other comments? Councillor Gardner. Thanks, Warden. Um, yeah, a, a couple of com comments. I do like the custom custom thing, you know, indicated. Um, just wondering if you've had some conversations with the OPP or with your professional standards. I know a couple of years back, um, I was on a on a course, and they were talking about with the new generation, the trend is to put the markings more on the road than on signs. Because it was proven with the insurance that 
uh, the younger generation tends to gravitate down instead of up. So I don't know if you've had those conversations. Yeah, it, they were finding in Western Ontario that for an approach stop sign, uh, the stop signs actually for the accidents with the younger generation, it was useless to have the approaching stop sign on the side. It was more beneficial to actually have it in road paint. So I, I don't know if you've had those discussions. Um, comment about the deer signs. It's right outside my parents' house in South Stormont. <laughs> And uh, hugely effective. You, you, when you're driving, you can actually see the deer. I guess the I, concept behind it was the predator eyes reflecting off the light or whatever. Um, there was massive accidents before those were installed, and you're absolutely right. Every time you drive and a deer, deer's been hit, it's always outside of the reflectors, usually near the golf course, because there's none down there. Um, so I would definitely, if you had three insurance companies sign on and actually give money instead of take money, there's probably some benefit to like that, that area. So I, I would like to see them maintained, and I have often uh, wondered how much of a pain in the neck it is to mow around, but I can tell you when you're driving you can see the deer behind the signs and there's a massive deer population because of the bird sanctuary so um, I would definitely like to uh, see that and I'm also wondering how do you determine installation of hamlet signs because I know in South Dundas we've taken the uh, approach that we uh, the municipality has their own hamlet signs but I was driving by uh, Gollinger town actually and I saw an SDNG hamlet sign so how do you determine um, what gets what? So, just a couple of comments and a question or two. Through you, Mr. Warden. Uh, yeah, the Hamlet signage. Uh, so, the county will install what we consider our standard Hamlet signs, which, which would be the one you saw in Gallinger Town, in any uh, settlement areas recognized in the official plan. So, that's what we provide. Should the local municipality wish to put that enhanced signage, which, you know, whether it's the big blue, uh, blue one or the big green one, depending on the uh, local municipality's design or the new ones that South Glengarry is designing, that's where it goes over and above what our policy is. Thank you. Any other comments? Councillor Smith and Councillor Fraser. Thank you. Through you, Warden. Uh, I don't agree with um, um, Councillor Byfeld's. Uh, I think we have to keep the finger... Uh, boards. As a matter of fact, I, I think the wayfinding boards would be much better if we were able to uh, incorporate the finger boards in those wayfinding boards. But uh, especially so much in the tourist areas, um, as, as he mentioned earlier, um, there's a lot of people coming through our areas that uh, are first timers and they don't know the way around. And I think I can say the same thing in the commercial areas as you're yourself as a truck driver. Um, it seems like the GPSs aren't, aren't, uh, working 100 percent and um the truck drivers are having trouble finding some areas in our townships so for that reason i think we need to keep them and if i could make just one other comment what i've noticed lately and and it's been brought to my attention by my constituents is maybe the material used for these uh, signs uh, because it seems like there's an awful lot of them are missing pieces uh, they're broken off and um I don't know if that would happen if we use metal. I don't know what the costs are. Metal as opposed to, to wood, they would be a better reflection material as well. But um, I think I brought it to Ben's attention. Um, there are several of these boards. I don't know how, especially in a wayfinding board, how, how a sign in the middle of three or four signs gets broken off, but uh, it, it happens. So uh, I, I think we need them and, and I would look at uh, changing material. Thanks. Councilor Fraser. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, to, uh, I think Ben was, uh, no, I'm sorry, Trevor was talking about it. Mr. Baker, uh, about the consistency in your, your uh, picture of the Chevron and the PowerPoint uh, and with the, uh, the, um, the checkerboard in the middle of that. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. And uh, I, I know that there's, uh, at North Dundas, uh, the deputy mayor, the warden, has concerns about those types of si that that type of signage to uh, to ensure that drivers don't uh, inadvertently go off the road, and uh, and uh, municipalities or the counties being held liable for not having proper signage up and consistent signage, and um, traveling as the the warden and I do, we do cover a lot of roads by mistake, and um, we see that 
we see that there's inconsistency, not just, uh, not, it's not a county thing, but even in our local municipality. And it's been uh, uh, something that the, uh, the deputy mayor has been championing, trying to get that consistency. I, I support removing the inconsistency and becoming consistent uh, and uh, where we can throughout uh, SDG offer those traveling um, confidence that what they see really means what's happening. And um, the option three, um, Councillor Bybelds has uh, studied this much harder than, uh, than I have, I admit. Uh, and, uh, but if we have options to choose, uh, I would be looking towards option three, uh, just uh, without the the, my, the 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 different little options involved in that. And I'm sure there'd be further discussion on that. Uh, the deer signage, I think of in uh, Councillor Wirtz and Councillor Landry's area up or Moose Creek, to travel different places that way. It's thick uh, with bush. It's, uh, it's, it is uh, a challenge some parts of the season to go that way. And uh, your your eyes are wide open, looking for deer jumping across, and not just one or two. Uh, quite often, it's 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 a number of them that are jumping across the county road. Nine, I think it's nine out there, and jumping across nine there. It's uh, and and again to the consistency, um, to uh, Councillor Garden's uh, uh, thoughts on the uh, the reflectors. Um, if the, if they are working, if the signage is working, I think we need to make sure that those areas that are identified as uh, thick and potential hazardous areas need to be treated in a consistent consistent way across the counties. And I think I'm done. Thank you very much, Mr. Warden. All right. Thank you. We will uh, we will certainly continue this conversation, but at this point in time, I need to get council's indulgence. I need to step out for ten minutes. There's a event across the street that uh, the warden has been requested to say a couple of words and I will come back and everybody can take this opportunity for a bio break and, and collect your thoughts and we'll continue down this. I think there's, a, there's, there's much more discussion to be had on these signs. Thank you.
All right. Thank you very much, Council, for indulging that process. It was uh, a an op speaking opportunity for Aqua Sosni, the City of Cornwall, and STNG for the Sparks Tourism Program. Uh, this would be the third year, but it's the second year in which monies are put forward. It seems to be a great program, uh, and it's it's nice to hear how many people and, and, and how you just can't keep the entrepreneurial spirit down, considering what's been going on for the last two years, and there's more than a handful of, uh, of people that are willing to put their money on the line and to start new businesses. Uh, it's, it's heartening to see just, uh, just more realization that, that nothing will keep the good people of Ontario and Canadians down. So it, it, was, it was nice to be able to attend that, and I appreciate your, your indulgence. So we can continue on if any new comments want to be made about the signage. Are you feeling lonely for this chair, Councillor McDonald, or something? Did you? So the smart one is speaking. That's good. All right, Councillor Williams and Councillor Warden. Thank you, Mr. Warden. <laughs> you finally figured that out, eh? <laughs> um, yes, we were talking. Uh, option three, is, as far as uh, Councillor McDonald and myself, looks good. And uh, keep the reflectors. They apparently are doing their job. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Warden. Uh, through you, Mr. Warden. Uh, I like option three as well. And I think that we need to keep the directional signs uh, kind of similar to uh, uh, the villages more so than the roads. Uh, and, and to build on what uh, Councillor uh, Smith had said, uh, we give a lot of money uh, for the RIPs and the CIPs, and we are trying to attract people from out of the area. So I think at a minimum, having the villages and directions uh, uh, are a good thing. And I think there was one sign you had mentioned about the stop sign, the, the, the sign in the middle. I think those need to be, they need to stay. Uh, even if you can see the stop sign ahead. Uh, I mean, South Branch and Somerstown Road is a very bad intersection. And there's lots of times uh, they're still running through the north and the south. Uh, and the stop signs, that sign and the stop sign are there. Uh, so I think th those need to be maintained at a minimum. Thank you. Councillor McGillis. Thank you. I agree with uh, the option three as well. I think it's a great idea. That, uh, it's, I think in more of safety issues to have something like that in place. Um, another question I have is, or question I have is uh, the flashing light for deer crossing. You see them there like on 138. I uh, wonder if you have had any comparables in the terms of the effectiveness of them as opposed to just the, uh, the other um, reflectors. Yeah, through you, Mr. Warden. Actually, I, I can uh, happily answer that one. It w I was at a uh, conference, a uh, transportation conference, several years ago, and uh, it was, you know, bringing professionals from across Canada, and they highlighted that exact project uh, as a, uh, it was a session on uh, wildlife uh, traffic and, and traffic safety. So uh, it was very interesting to hear about it because it was really a, a trial that the ministry was, was doing on Highway 138, uh, just south of Monkland. And, uh, and, and how that system works, it's a radar detection system looking for large animals in the forest, and if it detects it, it, it only activates the flashing beacons then. Um, it came at great cost to the ministry, and I'm not, I, you know, at the time they were simply kind of talking about the project itself, and they didn't have any, um, the, the challenge, they, they were talking more about the challenges of, of implementing that system, particularly with a horse farm right there, um, and how they had to manage some of those, you know, because the horse, would inadvertently activate it so how they had to fence that area off and long story short is we didn't have the uh, at the time we didn't have any of the um, uh, results of how effective that really was but it is a uh, it was at the time when it was installed a very unique system within Ontario and if that's something council wants us to actually start to look into in terms of areas of, of significant concern uh, I've, I'll be able to look back through my notes from that uh, conference and be able to make some contacts if, if that's the direction we want to take and start looking at stuff like that. I, I do remember it was I think very, though, also very a key consideration of that is the, is the two different ideas of, of those two separate systems where the one on the 138 is 
an enhanced warning system for the drivers, whereas the installation on County Road 2 is more of a deterrent to stop the deer from crossing. So they're not trying to achieve the same uh, intent purpose either. So, Well, I mean, yes and no. At the end of the day, they're both trying to start stop vehicle and deer collisions just with different methods, but uh, the, the end goal is the same. Um, I have one question without throwing a spanner into the works, but hearing the comments from Councillor Fraser and, and the uh, anecdotal but, uh, but well-lived uh, comment by Councillor Gardner, would there be any will to perhaps get these gentlemen to reach out, uh, not looking for costs from county dollars, but perhaps reach out to some of the insurance companies and see, since it was well pointed out that there are issues in North Stormont, and I'm sure each one of our townships have somewhat dangerous corridors where we have a, a lot of deer activity, and seeing how along number two at one point in time, I know it's 20 years ago, but there were, there were insurance companies that were willing to put some dollars towards um, mitigating their costs as well. If we could perhaps reach out and just have some high-level discussions and see if anyone's interested in some of our other corridors and see bring it back to council, would that be okay by council? Okay, if we could get you gentlemen to do that, you never know. They might want to invest and save some of their own money. Uh, and so just by a nod or show of hands, I, I, I'm hearing, I believe I heard that we would like option three, but can we just confirm that? Uh, okay, I think you've got your direction, gentlemen. Thank you very much. And now the administration building in the jail area. Oh, sorry, I did skip this. No, uh, I mean, it absolutely, con considering, uh, considering that we have a, a, a motion in place that, that deals strictly with two, uh, two projects, I think we should, uh, the council should revisit this to have something that actually includes SD and G and not just two townships. So it would be good. We cannot actually pass it today, but if we could at least work towards getting a framework that actually encapsulates all of SD and G, I think that would be prudent on our part. Mr. Dahan. Uh, thank you. Yes, and uh, entrances. Uh funny enough or, or not funny enough we're going to be uh, discussed at uh, this this meeting but really in the context of kind of the the last topic uh, that we'll talk about and certainly look to some of our um, our um, experienced counselors around the table because uh, it's, it's really feedback on some uh, field widths and, and agricultural field widths and whether we should be looking at those standards a little bit closer as well but I guess based on some of the feedback we've received obviously there's a, a desire to uh, take a closer look at our entrance bylaw and talk about how we want to amend it to uh, fit some of the uh, some of the challenges that we all face out there. Uh, so with that, um, we've we've kind of expanded on the original intent of what this uh, this committee, the whole discussion was going to be, and, and kind of captured entrances uh, as as a whole to look to uh, bring back an amended uh, bylaw for council's consideration and hopeful approval at some point in the near future. Um, Again, I always think it's important to talk about uh, the the safety side of it and the and the and, and why we do this and why we why we as staff uh, and certainly council care about entrances. Um, from the safety point of view, and I'm giving you a screenshot, and, and I just randomly took a screenshot in Alexandria. We do keep track of accidents, and I know it's a little bit hard to perhaps see, uh, but what what we've got here is just uh, accidents along county roads and what the issue was attributed to and whether it's wildlife driver or other and in a you know i would say a constrained urban environment it's obvious that driver is is the driver of many accidents that we see in our urban areas and and this is not to suggest that it's that it's access or entrance related accidents uh, only but that certainly is when we look at the detailed accident reports we do see that uh, on occasion uh, that there are um, you know the, the conflict between someone using an access point versus someone on the roadway and how that impacts uh, or results in accidents and i find it interesting then when you actually then go to and again this is just a random piece of of roadway south the county road 34 south of alexandria and you can see how it changes and it really maybe even comes back to our discussion on those deer reflectors how we have when you're in the rural areas you see along kind of open roadsides you definitely see more uh, accidents associated with wildlife 
and the driver uh, related accidents are generally at intersections or at entrances. Uh, we do have some runoff roads but we are lucky in, throughout the county we've got paved shoulders that helps with a lot of uh, people who actually kind of drift from the traveled portion of the lane because we have that safety uh, factor beside us so uh, people can safely recover. Um, so we don't have a lot of runoff road related accidents. It's more uh, conflict accidents that we, we tend to see throughout our roadsides. So getting into why we regulate them still, um, you know, uh, keep in mind uh, here, here SDG, we, we operate essentially the arterial road network for our region. And whenever, and this is a reference from the Transportation Association of Canada uh, Geometric Design Guide for Canadian Roadways, and uh, there's a bunch of different books associated with uh, TAC. And what it's really showing in this chart uh, that I'm highlighting here is that as the road becomes more uh, important from an arterial on how it moves traffic uh, perspective, um, it certainly is in the uh, municipality's best interest to uh, to control access in various ways. So um, locally, local roads, public lanes, local roadways, and those minor collectors, you can, you can allow un unrestricted access. So the idea of access control isn't as important. And then as you continue to get, you know, see the importance of the roadway in terms of its regional impact and how you move traffic, then, you know, there's, there's this um, importance put on trying to uh, provide access control. So trying to provide how many people are accessing, how they're accessing, uh, and making sure that there's standards in place to uh, make sure those accesses are safe. Um, in terms of actually uh, getting an entrance within, uh, if, if someone wanted to get an entrance along county roads, and this is something that Trevor and his staff deal with essentially on a daily basis, uh, relatively I would suggest a straightforward uh, process. Someone would submit an application, uh, we go out to the site, we inspect it, we are looking at sight lines, we're looking at the ditch, we're looking at what kind of entrance is being requested, and we're comparing it to the standards that are, that are um, published for safe access. Uh, then we issue that permit, uh, provided everything complies. If something is a little bit amiss, we do, we'll end up meeting with the landowner, talking about some alternatives and looking at ways to uh, correct it or, or to make the entrance safer. Uh, we'll issue that permit. The entrance gets installed by the landowner at their cost. Uh, we go back uh, either whenever the entrance is being installed or after the entrance has been installed. And um, I should say with, those, uh, with that permit, there's conditions, they've identified the contractor, they have the right kind of insurance, all those good things. Uh, we go back after the, the pipe has been installed, we inspect it to sign off on it because at that point we are now essentially accepting that entrance as part of our infrastructure. So uh, the, the pipe uh, is part of our infrastructure, the entrance itself in, in a way is part of our infrastructure, and then we take responsibility for that pipe forever. Um, typically, in so saying, if there's a change in property use, so if someone has, uh, for instance, a commercial property that they are converting to residential and, and there's a planning application, we typically um, look at that change of use and we will try and, if, if necessary, apply the appropriate standard to that, to that entrance to make sure it complies with current standards. So um, I'll try and give an example that, you know, someone, for instance, is converting an old school into... Um, uh, a residence, let's say. Um, we would take a look at that and determine whether there is entrance, uh, uh, entrance improvements that are needed to comply with current standards. So now we've accepted that pipe. Um, we will, after accepting that pipe, we will replace that pipe if it fails. So whenever it comes to a point when, when there's a failure of that pipe, we will uh, go and fix it at our cost. Uh, we will fix the surface of the driveway if we're the reason that that driveway has failed. So um, if the pipe has failed, there's a hole, and then all of a sudden you have a subsidence of the material on top of that pipe, and it leads to a big hole in the driveway, uh, we'll fix the pipe and we'll fix the driveway at the county's cost. Um, if we're ditching or improving some grading or drainage through an area, we replace the pipe and we'll replace the surface. Um, and so, if, for example, if it's a paved driveway, we pay for the cost to replace that paved driveway. 
Um, we do in wintertime, if there is a frozen pipe and it's causing drainage issues, we, uh, that's again our pipe, so we will take responsibility and we'll flush that pipe to make sure that drainage continues to work and it doesn't impact our roadway. Um, similarly, during any time of the year outside of winter, if there is drainage issues where a pipe needs to be flushed, so the pipe's in otherwise good condition and we need to address some maintenance issues with it, we will do so at our cost. And annually, we budget about $100,000 a year to do this kind of work. And that doesn't include the, we, that's the maintenance side of it. Um, if we're ditching, for example, the cost to replace the pipe falls generally under the ditching budget. So there is a couple of different areas of budget where uh, we are replacing pipes as part of, of the work that we're doing. Uh, again, I, I really want to highlight this for Council is that uh, I, there's, there's great value to maintaining control over those pipes. I think from a maintenance and um, you know, being able to maintain safe and good roadways, uh, having control of that roadside drainage is very, very important to us because it helps us to keep those roads safe and in good shape. Oh, excuse me. Uh, reflecting on the bylaw as it stands today, uh, it was approved in 2017. Uh, it was uh, the approval that, or the revisions that were done in 2017 were generally consistent with the previous entrance bylaw uh, it, that incorporated, but it incorporated existing practices, standards, and we actually married our ditch filling policy, which was a different policy, into that, uh, into that bylaw. So uh, from, from our perspective, there was really no major changes whenever we had looked at this bylaw in 2017, uh, but we understand obviously that Council wants to see some additional provisions included within the bylaw. And so really, I guess this is maybe the first kind of pause and question for Council, and, and the question is, what is that fundamental change that Council wants with this bylaw? I've summarized my understanding of it, but I certainly uh, am here and, and looking for Council's input on this. Um, so my understanding is that uh, Council feels very comfortable whenever people are getting issued a new permit, uh, that there's standards that they have to comply with. Um, you know, though we didn't get into the minutia of it, um, from you know, from a development perspective, new includes new development or properties undergoing a change of use that's subject to some kind of development approval. So it may not be an actual new, new build, quote unquote, but it is something that's happening on that property which is changing it from a kind of how you look at that property perspective. So again, this is, this is staff's understanding and I certainly welcome any uh, um, clarification if that's not what, what council is thinking in terms of the fundamental changes to this bylaw. Um, number two, uh, based on the feedback we've received uh, at a staff level, if um, my understanding is that if we are undertaking the work, so the county is the, the responsible party that's un undertaking the work that's impacting existing driveways, that those existing safe entrances can remain as is. And um, in so saying that we, uh, we, we do want to, I guess, give some flexibility to owners to allow them to change to comply with new bylaw standards if they want to. Again, this is my understanding of what, uh, where Council wants to go with the bylaw. And I think, although it wasn't implicit or it wasn't explicit uh, when we talked about it, but I, I do get the fundamental sense that unsafe driveways, Council certainly doesn't want to see those remain. If there's an opportunity to correct a, a, a defined or definite safety hazard, Council wants to see those things corrected. So. Um, Mr. Warden, if it's okay with you, I would appreciate uh, just to make sure because the rest of the presentation really is predicated on that understanding of, uh, of where Council wants to go with some updates to this bylaw. Yes, and you know, certainly considering the last meeting, we should take this step by step so there's clarity and understanding in this. Um, so, so far for these questions that are placed, can we get any comments, questions, and we'll stick on this point and then we will move forward. Councilor Warden. Through you, Mr. Warden. Ben, what is your definition of an unsafe driveway? Because um, a circular driveway to me is not considered unsafe. Is that something that you consider unsafe? If there's good sight lines at both entrances to that circular driveway, n no, I wouldn't consider it unsafe. If there's a sight line issue, or there's something amiss, like head walls at one of the driveways or both of the driveways, yeah, it's unsafe. So if you're coming into a village on a future project and there's an existing circular driveway without a sight line, uh, it won't be touched if we amend the bylaw to, to basically, um, you know, allow residents to have 
uh, some say with what's already existing. I guess yes. If we amend the bylaw, that, like absolutely. If that's the direction that uh, that we take, and we've got we've got some good policies in place, 100. percent That's uh, that's the direction. I would think that that's going to require definition in inside the bylaw, so that we're not at another point where you know we have a difference of opinion. The landowner thinks it's fine, and and the county engineer thinks it's not. I think it needs to be defined, so we don't have more. Uh, more of the pontificating that we've had. Councilor McGillis. Okay, thank you, Mr. Worden. Uh, I think the intent when I brought it up <clears throat> last time was was the, um, you know, keeping the existing uh, safe entrances as status quo prior to 2017 when that bylaw was adopted uh, because of the amount of money that people paid to fix their driveways the way they want them. Um, I don't think anybody had any problem with after that date. I mean, after the date the bylaw was passed, to uh, you know, to it, so that would it would be uh, adhered to um, because there's a law there. I understand, but the consistency is what we talk about. I know that um, before this, I didn't know about. Uh, I was talking to uh, Councillor Wart that this, this situation happened previously um, in Chrysler, and. We have to look at that issue too, uh, because I think that the, you know the people that are a little upset probably now today because now that there was a change. So there's a, the word about consistency. We're not. We have to be consistent in our rules and regulations here, in our laws and our policies. So I, anything that was done prior to the 2017, we have to ensure. I think because we've already done this, that uh, their driveways aren't changed unless it's a safety aspect of it. So the, um, previously to that, I think we still have to look at the situation that uh, Councillor Wirt went through in, in Chrysler, and I know that you want to bring this up probably not sooner and later. I don't want to speak for you, but I felt after I heard that, I mean, I wasn't here last term, and a lot of the people sitting here today, a lot of councillors weren't here either. But um, I think we have to... Um, put something in place where it's agreeable and inconsistent. So it's e easy to understand too, not just by the councillors sitting at the table, but by the members of the public as well. And of course, administration. Thank you. Anyone else at this point? Councillor Bywalds, then Councillor Wirt. <clears throat> Thank you, Warden. Um, I do agree that uh, as much as grandfather isn't quite terminology, but the, the old entrances uh, during construction should remain um, to whatever standard they have as long as they're safe. I agree with county that, you know, you don't want head walls. You don't, you know, um, you may have to define that very well in your bylaws so people understand that. The sight line issue may be a bit of a challenge. I understand where, you know, the, the specs are there. Uh, however, you know, a circular driveway allows a person to actually drive in instead of back out and and that actually is a safety enhancement more so than it is a a, a safety issue in my opinion but uh, uh on this particular one here that that would be my opinion on that the, going back uh that's a challenge council work yeah just uh just a point of clarification here uh I think when we talk about the existing driveways, it's important to make sure that those existing driveways were already previously accepted by the counties. So in other words, if, if we're changing something that, that a landowner felt that uh, was appropriate but didn't receive sanction from the counties, I think it's different than if they did receive sanctions and then we're coming back and saying, well, we've changed our mind because ultimately the guidelines we operate under should be expressing the same support for safety and sight lines and everything else. So the circular driveway as an example, are, have they all been uh, accepted as safe at one time and we're changing our code now or were they installed under different circumstances and we're bringing them up to code with today's world? I'll, uh, I'll start with the answer and then Trevor you can jump in because I might you might have some kind of hands-on experience 
I have yet to come across a situation where uh, a landowner, um, where they're where they're unsatisfied with the change that is compelled under the bylaw, where they're able to provide us with a permit that illustrates that they had they have had permission to do what they want to keep there. I, I can't think of a I can't think of an example, and I'm not saying that they aren't out there, and I'm not saying that it wasn't given at some point, but. I would suggest our bookkeeping probably in the last 15 to 20 years is much better than it was prior to that. So having those records is, is a little bit of a challenge for us. Uh, I like have, having those records and, you know, so, and some people, and I'm not disputing what they're saying, you know, they, they, they said, oh, I got permission to do it, but was it permission from a staff member who drove by and said, oh, that, that's fine, versus an actual permit. I, I don't know. I, and uh, I don't know, Trevor, if you want to maybe add to that or maybe you know, correct me if I'm kind of mis misspeaking here. No, that's, that's accurate. There's, there's, your summary is good. Uh, there's just the ad added factor of uh, back to those, those former highways again. When, when they were downloaded to us, uh, we didn't get those records either from the ministry. So whether the ministry issued a permit at one point and thought it was okay, we don't have those records. Sorry, and if I may, I think a lot of a lot of instances where we where we've seen a, you know, and I'm going to talk driveway widths in this specific instance where we've seen a creep in those driveway widths. Um, often it's not. I, I wouldn't suggest there's anything untowards in terms of how that has occurred over time, but rather someone doing maintenance on, you know, you need need some more gravel, so you pour some more gravel, and then the the slopes get really steep, and then. You know, they have the extra piece of pipe to be able to, you know, improve those slopes. And so they put that on and it's, you know, kind of slowly evolved over time to that point where it's, where it's kind of beyond what would be uh, identified as a standard within our bylaw. So uh, again, I don't, I don't, I'm not suggesting anything untowards or there's, uh, you know, any, anything mischievous or, or underhanded that, that happens with those entr entr entrances, but the reality is, is over time, we have seen instances where it, where it creeps. And there are instances as well where uh, we are on our patrolling, we identify an entrance that has been uh, modified over a long weekend. And in those instances, we certainly go back right away with, you know, to identify, you know, you're not, you know, you need a permit to do this, what's going on here? Uh, we expect it to be removed. This is this is our this is our pipe. This is our ditch, and you're modifying it. So we do have, and I mean, there's open files right now, and that's that's a very regular occurrence that we're dealing with. So I think that's that's something else, perhaps, to keep in mind when we're talking about accepting kind of what's out there right now, and how do we how do we balance between those two? Uh, yes, yeah, so without question, when we do get to this bylaw, there's going to have to be clear definitions so that uh, we don't we don't devolve again. Councilor Warden, uh, through you, Mr. Warden. <clears throat> so, uh, satellite imagery doesn't lie, and I think it would be a tool. I believe we have access to satellite imagery from years gone by, so you're going to be able to find out fairly easily how long the driveway has been the way it was. So you're coming into St. Andrews, we'll use that as an example. All those driveways have been the same for the last 30, 30 years, the majority of them. I'm not saying some of them weren't altered, but you have those tools in your chest to, to help you figure out whether it's, and then you can go back to them and say, look at, no, no. I mean, uh, we're gonna grandfather this because it's been around or uh, what is it, uh, existing non-conform, uh, but this is where we draw the line because clearly you've altered it without a permit. I mean, I think, I think the technology's there. Yeah, and to be to, to that point, uh, Google Google Street View and Google Maps are are excellent tools that we also use as reference points. So yeah, it, it's a fair statement. Any other comments before we move on, Councillor Fraser? Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, just to keep on touching on the unsafe driveways, um, let, let's say one was put in, uh, as, as Trevor mentioned, maybe prior to records being available to the counties, um, and it's not noticed to be unsafe, it's not felt to be unsafe, would it be held to the same standard as one that um, 
well, what I, it, it's, it's, a, it's I'm having a tough time getting around the idea of, of a driveway being unsafe and one that wasn't permitted. Uh, maybe it's safe and not permitted, uh, safe and not permitted, it had been there for 30 years. Uh, are they going to be subjected to something um, to remove that driveway that is safe in the opinion of, of, of county staff but uh, without a permit? That's the first of a few questions, and thank you. So a quick, quick answer to that one is I think, you know, we generally, as, as a rule of thumb, um, if the driveway's, like, we're not, anytime we're doing ditching, we're not going back through our records to see if there's a permit there or not. If the driveway's there, it's safe, it makes sense. We're doing our ditching, we're, we're applying the appropriate standard under the bylaw to replace that pipe. So we're not, we're not verifying every entrance is permitted as we're doing work. Like, we're not, but there are examples where, um, you know, and we'll talk about, you know, St. Andrews, that, that's exactly what we're doing. We're not denying any kind of entrance. We're just, we're, we're just kind of applying the appropriate standard based on the bylaw as we're doing the work. So, and that's, 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 that's our consistency, not necessarily if it's, whether it was permitted or not as we're doing the work. Well, thank you for that, Ben. But what I'm getting at is if we were to modify the bylaw and use that, that uh, concept of unsafe driveways need to be corrected, uh, and uh, we move, uh, if the bylaw is amended or changed to allow uh, the grandfathering, the existing to be replaced as existing, as it was, uh, would you, the unsafe part and the permitting is, is where I'm getting at. And, uh, and the removal of driveways is, is, it's, I almost see the two of them as is the same. If it's a safe driveway and it, it doesn't affect drainage, uh, then to my, my mind on this whole discussion, that's just a, a, an opinion of mine, then maybe the driveway, then not maybe, then the driveway should remain and be reinstated as it's been accepted, I guess, in a way, um, as a, as a township, as a county's, as a county's pipe. And if it hasn't been challenged as a county's pipe, and if it's been used as a county's pipe, and then in the future it would be treated and replaced as a county's pipe is sort of what I'm getting at, and that's where the unsafe and the permitting has just, I, I'm, I'm making it muddier for myself than anyone else, I think. Uh, but the, uh, the uh, yeah, I, I'm going to stop. Thank you, uh, Councilor Ward, and I'll move on to uh, number one. Um, I, th I think my feeling on the all new entrances issued a permit are to com comply with a bylaw. I'm not sure what the new bylaw is going to include, and, but I think the new entrances need to, com to comply with a bylaw. But I want to get back to your school example. Whenever, um, if the bylaw was to say five meters or eight meters or 12 meters or reinstated to its previous condition, um, but, a, but there's a, a school goes in and it becomes something, if they're at an existing school and becomes an industry and there's a change in the entrance needed, do they have to adhere to a bylaw? Do they apply for uh, a minor variance to the, to the new bylaw or to the existing bylaw? Yeah, we see often that kind of example we see through site plan control and being circulated from the local municipality. So, you know, if it is going from a, something to a school, yeah, then, then absolutely we're circulated under site plan and we take that opportunity to look at what's there and whether there is something that needs to be improved to, to meet an appropriate standard. Does, does that answer that question? I think it does. Thank you. I think I have clarity on that one. Thank you. Thank you for indulging me, Mr. Warden and Ben and Trevor. No problem. Story of my life. Um, any other comments at this point in time? Councillor Laundry. Thank you, Mr. Gordon. I'll just add my two cents. So when it comes to a bylaw, we, uh, uh, I believe in, in grandfathering in the sense that uh, the investment was made, it was there, and now all of a sudden because we as a county decide to, we need to change that culvert and change it the dynamic. So, so I'm a strong believer in, I think, what's being discussed here, but mind you, uh, I'm not sure if uh, Councillor McGillis, what was brought up to two, 2017, uh, I think we're opening up a can of worms if, if we do that. So a bylaw is, stands as it stands until we change it. But to, uh, am I correct where you were saying as, up to 2017, so anybody, like I mean, I don't know how many culverts were changed in the last three and a half years, but uh, we don't want to, or cannot, I believe, go back to, uh, to allowing what was followed to this bylaw that's in place right now. So uh, 
from what I'm looking at, we would look at changing moving forward from the day that it's passed, moving forward and not being really able to go back and have any changes of, uh, say for an example, the Chrysler situation, saying, oh, well, uh, you know, now we need to go back and start changing every culvert for the last four years. Yeah. So maybe add to that, Ben? No, I, I, I would, uh, I would, I think it's gonna be a challenge if we talk about actually going back, backwards and, and, and correcting. And I, and I must say, and I'll use St. Andrews as an example of the, of the 27 driveways we had completed by the time we were at uh, council and discussing it at our last meeting, of the 27, 22 of them were widened. So uh, it was only five that had, you know, I guess would be, you know, it, from the from the residents' point of view, negative negatively impacted. But I I think the perception was that we were narrowing everybody's, unfortunately, which was not the case. Actually, the majority we had widened to an improved standard compared to what they had. So, um, I th so the challenge coming back to uh, Councillor Landry's point, the challenge is going to be. Okay, if we have to go back to the, all the work we've done since 2017, and then it's a matter of are we actually contacting landowners and saying, "Are you happy with this? Do you want to like?" I I I see some pretty. It's that's a pretty onerous challenge, and I, and I suggest any change we make is from the change it's made going forward, and and we've. You know, the, the bylaw that existed is the bylaw that existed. And perhaps if there's a desire to a accommodate individuals who um, feel like they've been impacted negatively, we, we deal with them on a case-by-case -case basis in front of the council table if they're, they're still motivated to uh, bring, bring their concerns forward with respect to how their driveways have been reinstated. And last, the uh, uh, bylaw is only uh, as good as how anybody can interpret their bylaw differently. You read it, I read it, but yet we don't come up to the same or thinking of the same conclusion. But the, my only concern we have to be careful with is the safe and unsafe driveway is how we're going to perceive that because, again, uh, I could come up and county is saying, yeah, it's an unsafe and we're dealing with it this way where I perceive it's safe. So that's the only clarity that would have to be make sure that we follow a, a stringent guideline to uh, be able to defend regardless of if it is or not, but have a uh, uh, basically work on the same page for everyone. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good point, Council Lander. That's why bylaws have at a minimum a full page of the definitions in there the definitions was will have to be agreed upon certainly at this table so that again we don't run into the same issue that we just ran into um councillor gardner well, thanks warden armstrong um i uh sitting at this table last discussion uh i have absolutely no interest in going back to 2017 uh, if I could do that, I'd probably do something else other than the bylaw for the road uh, entrance way. Um, I think that's uh, somewhat disrespectful, only in the sense that we're all sitting here in 2021. We'll make decisions, and we're going to be a pretty slippery slope if every council goes back to former. So when I voted to have the discussion, it was about the current projects. Um, so I just wanted to state that, state that very clearly. Um, I think that uh, uh, there needs the discussion, the engagement of the residents, I think, is important in this. The discussion, we are, you know, um, working with our residents and that type of thing. And uh, I, you know, obviously the bylaw needs um, some tweaking. Uh, and I, I'm, I agree with that. Uh, the unsafe driveways, I would hope that the discussion happens prior to a project. Um, that those unsafe driveways are identified and and that that conversation happens so don't wait until because it's hard it's hard as a homeowner if you're sitting there going okay you're coming to me and saying it's unsafe but I've had this driveway for a really long time how come this conversation has never happened so I I think safety is always important and I think if there are unsafe driveways that have been identified I'd I'd really like to see those conversations happen uh, prior, way prior, like when they're identified, um, not waiting for a major construction project. So those are just my comments. Thank you. Any other comments? Oh, Councillor Fraser, you're going to give it another shot. One more, one more thing. Thank you, uh, 
Thank you, Mr. Warden, for allowing me another opportunity to uh, muddy the waters for myself. Um, I, I did. I do believe I heard the comment, and uh, that uh, whenever we talk about the the residents in Chrysler and how they may have come to accept the driveways, to paraphrase, they've come to accept uh, the what they have in front of them, what they drive on. They've come to accept the modification to their driveway and. Uh, uh, I, paraphrase they've learned to live with it um, much as we all do you know we have rules change we have to adapt and we do adapt and uh, it's unsettling at first but uh, the, the sun uh, does seem to come up the next day um, we're making a modification we're discussing modifying the the fundamental changes to the bylaw this is a, is this a, uh, for my clarity please is this a fundamental change from today going forward and uh, the driveways in St. Andrews would apply to the 2017 bylaw? Is this uh, the intent? No, I, I think we've got our direction with respect to St. Andrews. I think what we're looking for is how we move forward and, and how we are, uh, how, how we are, you know, what, what council wants to do to change the bylaw so that it reflects the, the will of, of council. And that's why I, I've highlighted these kind of three points because that's my, you know my interpretation of what I've heard, but uh, but there's been lots of lots of different ideas discussed around the table as well. So, you know, I, I didn't want to. It's very complex, as as you as you well note. It's very complex how the work we do, because because we're administering this bylaw multiple times a day, and and we have to be very cognizant of of how those changes are going to impact the various scenarios we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, certainly, like as as we continue on in this discussion, this isn't my last slide, but as we continue on in the discussion, I'll, you know, I'm going to bring up a couple of, of examples that I think you know highlight some of the challenges because because ultimately you're looking to staff to administer this bylaw, and and from staff's perspective, the the clearer and the more black and white the bylaw is, the the better it is, and the easier and more consistent we can apply it for for our residents, and. Um, you know, I'd suggest, by and large, the majority of the interactions and instances we where we're, we're dealing with this bylaw are very positive. But I mean, I recognize that there are instances where where it's also you know it's not it's not desired the change, and there's there's challenges with the change from the residents' point of view. So, well, thank you for that answer, uh, Ben. And uh, so, I just want to uh, make it clear my feeling on it is that uh, um, this this bylaw moving forward the bylaw or the direction for St. Andrews. Uh, I'm uncomfortable with the idea that we're not addressing the, uh, the discomfort suffered by those in Chrysler or those other, <clears throat> excuse me, residents that have suffered discomfort over uh, the 2017 bylaw. It's just that uh, uh, I'm not happy with that, and, but I do understand this is the direction of council and I understand that's the direction you've been uh, given and thank you. Yep. Yeah, just perhaps for further clarification, Councillor Fraser, uh, what was passed? If you are in, if there was work done in Alexandria, if there was work done in Morrisburg, if there was work being done in Winchester, they would be applied the 2017 bylaw. It's only those two projects that the, that his council voted on that would have any changes. Other than that, everyone else lives under the effect of the 2017 bylaw. Hence, why we need to get some definitions so that we can actually reflect all of SDNG as opposed to two spots. Thank you for the clarity, Councillor McGillis. I just want to uh, thank uh, Ben for having the on-site meeting on Friday to uh, discuss uh, the differences between the the widths of driveways. And I think you made a good point there that day in um, saying that you know. The, the unsafe driveways were the narrow ones, and you made and you fixed that because you followed the by, the bylaw of 2017 to make it with a minimum standard of five meters. So I just want to say that that's what I think it was. The driveways that are wider, that are pre-existing today, prior to 2017's bylaw, there's not a I don't see anything unsafe about it, and I don't think anyone does. Um, but the ones that are more narrow. And that's within that guideline of 2017 bylaw, this one. So I think it's a great idea. That part of it is in there. The inclusion is that you're going to make it safer. And that's what you're doing. And I think that's a, that was a, one part of that bylaw that was, that was good. Thanks. Okay, Ben, I think you can move on. 
Okay, and, and I just like to focus on this slide in particular. I didn't hear any of the feedback that suggested my understanding of the direction council wants to take was incorrect. So uh, we'll we'll continue on. Um, now, you, in your council package, you would have the full a copy of the existing bylaw, and I'm kind of going section by section through this point just to um, highlight what. Uh, what changes council can consider or, or what staff would consider to try and meet the intent of, of what I'm saying right here. Uh, so in terms of uh, the, the bylaws that exist right now, uh, the definitions, you know, I, I, I take to heart uh, what uh, Warden Armstrong has mentioned about definitions. And I think that there's, although I say in my slideshow and in my report, there's no proposed changes. Perhaps there is an opportunity to uh, strengthen some of those definitions. Backing up a little bit. The, uh, the idea is we'd like to prepare a draft for council's consideration and then get it, get it passed. I don't want to come here with a final bylaw unless council feels very comfortable with the draft. I guess that'll be up to the, to the clerk and I if we can finagle that at our next meeting. But this is by far not the last time council's going to see this. We'll, we'll continue to move this forward to get it changed as efficiently as possible. Um, so back to the definitions, I think we've got to take a closer look at it and see where we can include some additional definitions to strengthen some of the intent and, and, and what council wants to see here. Uh, in terms of classifications, we're not proposing uh, in any draft a change of classification. So the classifications, you know, field, um, residential, uh, commercial, we're not changing any of those. Under issuance of entrances, that section, we're not proposing any changes. And I just want to highlight that there is, in that section, it does allow residents to appeal decisions to council. So, again, reflecting on the on Chrysler, uh, I would I would suggest that perhaps if if the if the bylaw does change, maybe there's an opportunity for the residents that 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 still feel uh, so inclined to. Uh, discuss or, or challenge the the change to comply with the bylaw, uh, perhaps to come to council and, and council can make the, that determination if they if they deem appropriate at that time. Uh, section four is uh, restrictions, uh, and then subsections E and F under those restrictions uh, compel the removal of redundant entrances. So, getting back to the idea of horseshoes or multiple entrances onto the county road from one property. Um, what I'm suggesting as, as, a, as a consideration for council is in subsection F adding the following. So it's added on to what, what exists there. When the county is initiating work that will impact entrances, e.g. maintenance or construction, all existing entrances, including multiple entrances to a single property, shall be reinstated in accordance with section 7, provided the existing entrances do not pose an undue safety hazard in the sole discretion of the director or designate. So that's how I'm suggesting we uh, accommodate uh, those instances where there's an existing entrance. We're initiating the work, and the resident wishes, or the or the the, biz, the resident wishes to keep those entrances as is. Now the caveat, and, and maybe what I'll point out, and we can have a little bit of a discussion point on this, is uh, I you know thinking about this, and I was reflecting. I was in Morseburg yesterday, and there's an example of a job where um, it wasn't easy with entrances. Uh, it was not easy. Um, I think if you look at how they're being constructed today, I, I think there's a, there's a great argument that uh, it's going to work very well from what I've seen just even in the, some of that initial layout and some of the curbs that have been poured. Things are working, they're going to work very, very well. And it's a significant improvement. And part of the reason we got funding for that project was talking about rationalizing, rationalizing entrances, making things safer, more efficient. And I guess my... A caveat to council is, is with this with this type of language we may lose our impact to like there are entrances in Morrisburg absolutely that were um, you know I would I would have deemed it unsafe because of how they were arranged there are entrances that you know although maybe not unsafe from a traffic perspective required some uh, realignment uh, relocation or a modification to the width to uh, address some width issues so uh, I think you know, creating this, creating this ability in the bylaw is going to challenge us on projects like that going forward. And I, I'm just going to put that out for a comment. But again, that's uh, I'll leave it to council to have that discussion. Okay. Uh, Councillor Williams, then Councillor Warden, then Councillor Gardner, and uh, at that point, we'll have to make a decision for lunch. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, I'd like to suggest that. Um, what be added in that is that all existing entrances 
including multiple entrances to a single property, shall be reinstated um, if requested, upon request. So that if the owner doesn't request the reinstatement, that then that um, driveway would then um, be standardized. So maybe maybe they they wouldn't object to having it standardized is what I'm saying. Which should work towards your ends is is. Uh, yeah, we can if if that's the desire of council, we can we can kind of add something along the lines of when requested. I, I guess it's is it when requested or when. Like who who initiates the request is maybe the. Well, if the county were to ask the property owner, say we are, and then that way you would have the opportunity to say we are, we are encouraging standardization of driveways. However, because yours is not standard, um, you, you are entitled to have it remain the same unless you're willing to have it standardized. I mean, because that's, after all, what the original bylaw was looking for. but it still gives an option. Thank you, Councillor Warden. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, so would there be a metrics to determine uh, that there's a safety hazard or like my concern is just that, oh, there's two driveways and we don't want that. Um, it's a hazard and you have to take one out. So is there gonna be a metrics for so the line there that does not pose undue safety hazard and the sole discretion of the director. So what's the metrics there? Uh, if the director doesn't want to have the two driveways, even though council has said that we feel that if it's existing, uh, it should be remaining. So what, you know, what assurances that do we have that we're not going to be getting calls from the residents that you guys are just taking the driveways out because you don't want them. I like. I, what's the? Is there metrics? There are metrics in in the bylaw with respect to sight lines. I, like to me, that's the the biggest single kind of safety concern we look at. Is that the only safety concern we look at? No. Um, but you know, I, I, if I'm I'm going to be f frank with council. I mean, uh, you know, we I'm a professional. I strive to treat every circumstance as, as black and white and as, as reasonably as I can. Nobody in our office loves telling people no or making people angry. Um, so I guess my answer to you is that this is common language in the bylaw and I would suggest that although maybe council doesn't always agree with that decision, I'm making that decision in, in, in a genuine um, uh, genuine best interest based on professional judgment is, is the best way I can put that. Because I don't think I can outline every circumstance uh, off the cuff uh, as to what may or may not constitute a safe entrance because there's multiple, uh, there's, there's so, so many different iterations of what's safe and what's not safe. Councillor Gardner. Thanks, Warden Armstrong. Could we perhaps define a residential entrance and a commercial entrance just to to define how, because, I mean, a, a house, right, it, it changes hands. Fair enough, it's a house. Um, a commercial property, though, like the ones you mentioned uh, in Morseburg, um, you could have a, a, a business that maybe doesn't have sufficient like a lot of traffic, all of a sudden it changes hands and it's got more traffic. So maybe the argument could be made is because I've, I've noticed the curbing and it, it is quite, quite an improvement. Maybe we need to separate those two somewhat so you have a little bit more um, control when you have a, a concentrated commercial area versus a residential. I don't know if that's just trying to separate the two. Yeah, right? yeah, like, yeah. I'm, I'm hearing you. So if I, if I hear you correctly, the suggestion is all existing residential entrances shall be reinstated with the, with the, the middle part shall be reinstated. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I mean, okay. you're changing the landscape of the Highway 2 in the commercial area of uh, Morseburg, so perhaps there needs to be language that speaks specifically to commercial elements. I don't know. I would think that uh, that just by definition of commercial versus residential, that there would be more traffic flow. That I could, I, I don't know why there wouldn't be a difference in the definition between a commercial entrance and I, I would assume a commercial entrance should maintain a higher standard, or have more more uh, more clearly defined uh, items that are that that cause it to be unsafe. I mean, you know, my house. As most of you can guess, with my disposition, not, almost no one ever comes, so my laneway is not needed. But uh, I'm sure some around with their commercial businesses would have multiple vehicles coming in and out. Um, the what, what we're going to do now is break for lunch. So what I would like to do is if everyone could, we, we will start with, with uh, Councillor Williams and work around that side and then go up the middle and then down this side, if you could go and get your pizza and then bring it back to the table so that we're not uh, congregating. And we will, I guess maybe to 1230, we will, we will come back if that works and if everybody eats quickly.
All right. Thank you very much to uh, staff and whatever restaurant provided that food for us. I know I'm okay without going very going a long time without eating, but some of you guys might be suffering a little bit, you know. Uh, okay, so we will pick up where we left off, except for the fact that uh, the Councillor McGillis has ceded his time and doesn't have a comment for you at this point. So, uh, does anyone else from staff, have, or staff, sorry, does anyone else from Council have a comment to make at the start of this, or should we have Mr. DeHaan continue on? Councillor Jaworski and then Councillor Wart. Thank you, Three Warden. Um, because in the staff report for this section you raised this point, I just want to ra raise it myself, my opinion on it, is, um, you know, you posed the question about does Council want to maintain the premise of only uh, allowing the one residential driveway per new property? Oh, so we're going to the, am I jumping ahead then? I'm sorry, shall I stop or shall I continue? You are so far ahead of us, Councillor. Oh. <laughs> Okay, I'll keep going. Um, so, uh, obviously safety is uh, paramount when it comes to what we should allow and not allow, but I think we have to be careful not to use safety sort of as, um, as a hammer. Sometimes I think we, we let that definition encroach too far. And, uh, and I, do, I do understand that, you know, from an efficiency standpoint and a standardization standpoint, that it's it's preferable uh, if you're uh, you know having to administer the, that that, but um, I think you know same as how we were discussing in existing driveways how horseshoe driveways are not a priori uh, unsafe. I think also moving forward, I don't think that we should necessarily say that more than one act, more than one residential entr entrance way is considered unsafe. And so I I, I think that we should entertain. Uh, the possibility of folks having more than one entrance, you know, for example, with the horseshoe driveway, but I don't, I think there, there should be a mechanism to that to make sure that there is a recognition that that's getting above a certain standard and that the homeowner needs to um, uh, pay for that sort of above and beyond uh, level of service. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wirt. Through you, Mr. Warden. Uh, so uh, these comments are made with the greatest respect for everybody that's sitting in this room, but I see two issues here that we're addressing, and I think they're complicating the, uh, the process. I think one pertains to the bylaw as it is and, and any changes that may or may not be required. The second thing, though, pertains to how we got to this position, and I think that it's if evolution is going to be positive, we need to take a look at, at the process that brought us here and evaluate as to whether or not that is positive. And I sat here this morning and listened to Ben's comments and I actually learned more than I learned at the last meeting because I didn't have the proper context. And the point I'm wishing to make is that we all are subject to pressure of all kinds, and petitions are the greatest way for that to be impacted on, on council. But I, th I think we would be wise in the future that if, if we are under a pressured situation, that we allow our staff to respond so that any decision that we're going to be making is going to be done in such a way that we're basing it on all the evidence that possibly could pertain to it because I think part of the complexity that we're addressing here is that we've solved one problem, but in doing so, we've created a lack of consistency, and this is what this house is all about, is we're always dependent on consistency. So if the, if the bylaw needs to be changed, and you know, personally, I, I don't, I don't have a firm position on it yet. I continue to learn and it's a very complex, long, detailed thing. Then I think council provides direction for staff to, to change the bylaw to meet our expectations. But I think the bigger takeaway here is that as a council, if we're subject to pressure that may or may not be uh, uh, processed properly, that we would be wise to slow it down a little bit and allow council to receive direction and reports from staff that we can make sure that we're building on a solid base. 
Those are my comments. Thank you. Councillor McDonald. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, I couldn't agree with uh, more with Councillor Wirt. Um, I believe in the last, you know, and I, I just, you know, just to talk about the petition, we had 75 to 80 names on a petition. Um, and if anybody's ever signed a petition, you often just sign them just to get the person to, to leave. They, um, we were originally dealing with two property owners. We end up, we have all these property owners that are upset. And in fact, 20, was it 22 and 27, were those the numbers? 27, uh, five of them were, were, were decreased and 22 of them were increased or, or the same. So we, we're, we don't, as a, as a council, we should never be we influenced by, by petitions. We, we can take the information, and as he said, we wait for, to get the proper information like we're getting today, but we make decisions based on, uh, on very little knowledge of, of what's happening. And I, and I just want to talk about Morrisburg and, and what's happened there. What's going to happen when we go to Alexandria? We have, we have driveways in Alexandria. I think of one right in the downtown that's uh, 40 feet long, so uh, 40 feet wide. So what, do, what are we going to do when we get there? We've we, we got to be careful that we're going to make decisions and changes that are going to influence the future when we may be, making, we may be coming back to this table and going, holy geez, now we've got to come back and we've got to do another amendment to the bylaw because we can't have that happen. We have to think this through. And, and, and perhaps, yes, maybe there needs to be some changes, but we need to come up with the proper changes so that we're not coming back to the table every two months with a petition for somebody wanting something done. So I just, I caution us to be careful with what we, what we wish for, because at the end of the day, we may come back and we may have to make changes in the future. Councilor McGillis. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr. Warden. Uh, just reflecting back, I, I don't believe like the petition was the thing that uh, made the difference or altered any, anybody's decision. We had another vote on this because of the first, this is prior to any petition coming forward to the counties. Um, there was a mistake in the count and it was, it was a miscount. That's, that was done in the previous week, uh, meeting. So the petition really didn't alter any ideas or any changes into the, in the uh, vote. So that's why I requested another vote because there was a, it was a miscount and it was successful the first time prior to the petition. So this has nothing to do with both petitions. Nobody mentioned anything about petitions except for myself. I mentioned it once or twice maybe, possibly. The petition is not, is, 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 it was the major uh, factor here to, uh, make, to make the decision in terms of, it was about pre-existing driveways. People had something that was gonna be taken away from them. That's what this was about. So that's all. Councillor Bywelds and then Councillor McDonald. Thank you, Warden. Um, I, un I understand where uh, Councillor McDonald and Councillor Ward are coming from on petitions, and to be honest, the petition didn't sway my thinking whatsoever. Petitions come across our desks all the time, and um, I'll do respect to those who start them. I've seen, I think, far too many that have any <clears throat> validity to them versus the ones that have any validity to them. And uh, as a, no disrespect to the, the last one at all, but um, I've seen some wild ones out there and, and they really turn you off on what petition is really valid and what they're really uh, necessary for. Uh, having said that, I, I will say that uh, it had no bearing on my thoughts before or after I still agreed. Uh, uh, that those who have driveways that uh, are there now should at least be um, talked with to see uh, what the right driveway is. I, I, I do understand where you're coming from, Council McDonald, in the commercial sector. Like, if we allowed people in the, the commercial areas in Morrisburg just to have wherever they wanted, they would have said, "Well, I like what I got," and it. I think in the end, there was a lot of discussion. We as council in South Dundas certainly wore it the first year we were out because everybody thought they were losing everything. But in the end, I think there was some compromises that were <clears throat> beholden because of it. And uh, I certainly wouldn't want it to, to stop that project. But when it comes to 
you know, the residential driveways, the farm driveways. Um, I think there should be discussion. I know I will have some points on the farm entrances later, but uh, to take away um, a driveway that somebody's had for a reasonable amount of time and that's been reasonably safe is a, is a challenge to anybody, I think. Um, we have to be fair both ways. Thank you. Councilor McDonald. Mr. Don. Uh, thank you. So I, I think uh, just before I go on to the next questions with respect to uh, this, my uh, takeaways from the proposed amendment uh, that council, again, will have that opportunity to, to uh, mull over uh, with our next draft is that we want to limit it to uh, uh, you know, having that um, ability to reinstate to existing on residential and, and maintain some control for commercial. Um, and then the other part of it was the engagement with uh, the resident in terms of how, uh, if, if there is a potential change, making sure we're engaging with the resident, giving them that opportunity to maintain what they have versus going to a standard. So uh, with that, that's, that's the, my takeaway. That's what my notes reflect, and that's what I'm going to try and come back and have, uh, have something that uh, council can consider. Um, in so saying, uh, now I guess two questions for council. Um, if we're if we're looking at allowing existing entrances, uh, multiple entrances to uh, which front county roads to stay, uh, is it is it anything that's there, or is there a maximum number? I mean, typically it's you know one to two, but there are instances where we see very, like a significant amount of entrances, three plus is. Is it two that we want to say, or we're just going to, uh, you know, and again, I'm looking for this direction. Anything that's there can remain there, which is, I think, the sentiment of council. And then question two to Councillor Jaworski. She ruined my surprise. Um, but uh, does, does council want to uh, just, uh, you know, in, in, as a duty of fairness to all taxpayers across the county, um, do we want to say, yes, we can let you keep those ones, but we're only paying as an organization for one, and therefore, because we're reditching and your other two are going to be impacted, uh, it's going to be your responsibility to pay for the cost of the work we're doing for those two. So I guess I'll, I'll throw that to council and let council uh, give us some, some direction with that. And um, if, if I guess the direction is doesn't matter on the number of driveways and no, we accept the f fiscal responsibility, then, then I don't think there's any amendments. But if I do get some direction otherwise, then I have to think of some wording, which, again, would come at the next draft. You're not making it easy, Mr. Don. Um, okay, so well, I guess we'll go around the horn. Do we want uh, as many laneways as somebody can want? Uh, do we have any concerns about laneways? Is it, I mean, it's not that long ago that we thought maybe we can't have an entrance into an A&W in Winchester, for instance, because there was no safety, but there'll be nothing but safety if we allow every residential person to have as many laneways as they want. Um, what is the will of this council? We start with Councillor Warden so we can get some direction to these gentlemen and work on our next issues. Uh, my thoughts are whatever's existing stays and allowing the option for a second driveway for something new is, 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 a, is a perk that the residents, if they want it and it makes sense, they can pay for the second driveway. But anything existing as of today, it's, that's the way it was. And moving forward, uh, if they want to put the second driveway in, it's at their cost. And there'll be a process uh, so that when you're coming through in 20 years, uh, that you know that they're paying for the second driveway. You have that? Uh, yeah, I guess let's, uh, so I'm just going to reflect back, and, and I didn't, and, and my apologies if I didn't understand it. My understanding, and, and I did hear some comments about that, but I didn't, my, my takeaway wasn't that way with, um, with the standards contained in the bylaw, I had understood we were going to allow people to maintain what they had, but for example, if they wanted to create a horseshoe driveway, the way the bylaw is written and, and the drafts that are here now, it still is only one entrance per property. So is, is that a change? Like, council wants to allow the ability for horseshoe driveways? A, this is not to cut you off, but I will cut you off, Mr. Don. What, what I think would be the most prudent is that you will collate and collect the information that this round of questioning gives. 
and then you can sum up at the end to make sure that the consensus is at council. But right now, I wouldn't question each one, collect the information from the members, and then we'll go over it and we'll see if everybody's okay with that to move forward. It may be, and I, this is no disrespect to Councillor Warden, it may be that's the only opinion like that. So we don't need to discuss each and every one, or all 12 may agree with it. So let's wait until we have a consensus, okay? Councillor McGillis. Thank you, Warden. Um, what I was looking at and at first was anything after 2017, the, the existing bylaw that's in place now, I have no problem leaving it the same. It's, it was the pre-existing that I was concerned about. And that's what I was, um, I guess, you know, bringing up when it first started and when the public was coming to me with the problem. So what I'm saying is I agree with Councillor Warden. The, the existing driveways that are there that are new after 2017, follow the bylaw. The ones that were there, they were not, or you can call it non-conforming, pre-existing, or grandfathered, anything you want. Allow them to have the driveways, as we said, the way they have them. So that they already paid for everything, they already paid for their asphalt, they already paid, they know exactly what they have. But anything new, follow the, follow the new bylaw, the one that we have from 2017 on. And I think that's your question. Your, your, your concern was anything after that? Is it gonna make any changes? I say no, personally. I don't think we should change anything after that. So I agree with the existing one from that day on. Sure. So the existing one, except for the two projects that, that you folks voted on, everybody else goes with 2017? Okay. Okay. That's been new since 2017, has to follow the bylaw of 2017. Any driveways after, from today on have to follow that bylaw. The ones that are already pre-existing, that have the wide driveways, and we were going to narrow them because we had a new reconstruction uh, project going on. No, we leave them the way they are because they were pre-existing. That's so easy. The new bylaw, everybody has to follow. You can't have a horseshoe driveway now. You can't install one now because it doesn't allow it in the new bylaw. Okay? Okay, thank That's you. That's consistent. That's consistent. Sure. Councillor Bybelt. Thank you, Warden. Um, <clears throat> I'm not really in favor of, of, of multiple driveways except where um, space allows. And some people do have large lots in the country that they might want to put an accessory building in behind their residence. And to get there, they need a new driveway. And in my opinion, if, it, if there's enough width of, road, width of lot, and it's not like it's, it's uh, <clears throat> a super busy driveway because it, it'll be to whatever the uh, accessory building is, um, I think there should be an opportunity that they could at least approach you or approach somebody to see if that's something that that would be allowed and I, and I know you're going to have to come up with specs and, and use some judgment but if it's like a really narrow residential lot one driveway is it if it's you know say it's 100 meters you got enough room there to do what you need to do and, and most people would like to have sometimes an accessory building in behind to do things and the only way to access it is their current driveway and maybe it won't work it's just that's an opportunity where I see it. Other than that, no. Uh, comment on that is it, that gets messy because it's a 99 meters, 101 meters. Like I, I think, quite frankly, if, if I'm being you know quite honest with council, I prefer you know, and, and similar to how we dealt with it on County Road 27, the individual came to council. This is our bylaw. Council made said, you know what, makes sense. He wants to build an accessory building. Uh, that uh, he can't access with his original driveway because of the septic bed and the pool in the backyard and there's no kind of convenient way to do it and council made that decision like to me that's the best process and that's the process I'd continue to, to I guess encourage council to uh, follow because there's an example of a, of a, of a lot that's probably and I'm, I'm going off of memory here but you know 100 feet wide and so, so you know and and again too I, like we that door opens, we're doubling the amount of, you know, they're potentially doubling the amount of, of pipes that we are responsible for. 
across the county. I'm, again, exaggeration, but that's, that's, that's my point, is like if we keep very consistent and clear um, specs, then, then, it, then it, from an administrative point of view, makes it easy, and, and certainly if people want to challenge it or, or have a different view of how they want to approach uh, the use of their property, I think coming to council and letting council make that decision on, on each merit, I, I like that. Makes it uh, certainly from staff's administrative and enforcement point of view, very straightforward. This bylaw is, gonna, is going to hinge on definitions. So this group is going to need to have some direction for Ben to go, come back with definitions, and then we can see if we can get consensus on the definitions because it is going to be very difficult if we want to say just stay the same and then use your opinion and allow it. That is, without a doubt, setting up staff to fail because then someone can be marching across a field with a pen and paper and, you know, make comments and say, oh, no, that was crazy, I didn't like that. Uh, we'll need to hinge on definitions and, and council will be the, the arbiters of those definitions, which is everything within your right. So that's what is written down and we agree on the definitions. Everyone here has the say, not staff, and then they will, they will go under those auspices. So we should keep that in mind, but we will continue to move down and see if we can get some direction for these gentlemen next. Councillor Laundry, then Councillor McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, so, yeah, similar to a uh, minor variance process, which is similar to what you're talking about, the septic bed was in a way, I think would be a valid way of dealing with it. It's not every day you get these things. And by doing it that way, I think we can have a solid zoning bylaw and deal case by case through this similar to minor variance. My concern, okay, dealing back and you're saying, okay, do we allow one uh, entrance. I've had two cases, one's been rectified, so about three weeks ago, about no, in, or no, I shouldn't say no entrance, shared entrance. So County Road 13 has a case where it was a shared entrance. One looked, appeared to go to the first house, and then there was a veer off to go to the second house. Well, you have a, a camper, you, it is hard, so he, his intent is to push his own driveway and, and have his driveway. It's a, it's a, separate lot so they're not tied together by any means so uh, I think I brought it up to you but I didn't go deep into the conversation where does that apply where like in that case he's been told that no you can't you have to stick to your shared driveway I'm not sure if it's the exact instance or not but where that applies is when it is a term of condition of severance or uh, right away widening that would have had a reserve in front of it. <clears throat> so there are instances where uh, the property existed, there was an entrance there, uh, severance was made so that it became, say, two lots, but the spacing or the density of the entrances didn't comply with the official plan uh, rulings, so that became, uh, as they created the lot, it needed to have part one and two created. It's, it's officially registered on title as, as that entrance serving those two properties, if that's if that answers your question, without getting into that specific instance, I'm not sure of. Okay, but if I may add, so yeah, the one foot reserve, but can it be where I'll lift the one foot reserve to allow me to now reapply to get my specific individual entrance to my own property versus accessing through the neighbors? And I, I think, you know what, you're, you're raising an interesting point because that was something we changed in 2017 was that was how uh, a lot of individuals had w had been able to meet the driveway spacing provisions in the official plan to get a severance that would have otherwise been a no because they, you know, we're creating ribbon development along county roads. Um, so, but they, there was a bunch of challenges associated with shared entrances. So in this revision, if you read, uh, and I don't have the section in front of me, but it actually discourages shared driveways going forward. So that's not something we even, when we're looking at a severance and the creation of a new lot, we even consider um, uh, for, as an opportunity for people on, on how they can uh, get a severance. So I guess to answer your question very specifically, um, we'd have to look at the circumstances of, of it. I believe it's a, an example, as, as Trevor has described, where that was how that lot was created and that was a stipulation of that lot and that was, that's, that's tied to the title of that property. Council can choose to lift that one foot reserve if they want to. Um, and that's something we can bring forward to council, uh, like again, as a, as a specific scenario. But going forward, we are discouraging shared entrance where we can. Perfect, thank you. Councilor McDonald. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, if the warden would permit me to ask a question directly to Mr. McGillis. My, I've sat here for a few minutes trying to understand what you're talking about. So all you're saying is we change nothing in this bylaw except we add one clause that says any pre-existing entrance prior to 2017 would be, would be put back as the way it was made. That's all you're... No, I don't at all. Um, I think that the gist of it is what I said, yes. Um, anything that's pre-existing prior to 2017 bylaw, like, for example, um, any, any driveway or entrance that was constructed prior to 2017 may be... Um, would be reinstated to... Reinstated to the original way it was previous to any re road reconstruction. Thank you, Mr. Warden. So are we going through all this basically for just throwing in what we are not allowed to call it is a grandfather clause? We can throw a grandfather clause in. Would everybody be satisfied after that that we're still continuing to follow the same bylaw for anything that's newly being built? Okay, so now we got... So I guess the question that I have would be, in the situation where we came into St. Andrews, um, were any of the homeowners offered the opportunity to request of council for uh, uh, um, a deviation from the bylaw? Or did staff just say, sorry, this is, our, this is the way it is, and sorry, this is the bylaw? Were, were the residents offered an opportunity to come to council and ask for relief from the bylaw? And I'll go specifically to County Road 27. I remember that file very well. It didn't conform to the bylaw. The, uh, the, the resident requested relief from to have the second driveway installed. Were the residents in Sanders offered that opportunity? The one, the five that have the issue with what the bylaw? Because I think I could have avoided everything if they would have been given the information to say, okay, so this is our bylaw. If you'd like to amend it, request to the council. Right? Like for, the, for an exception. I think that would have avoided the whole, what we're talking about today. I think that's a question for the clerk. It's a valid question, but I think it's a question for the clerk because it speaks to policies and procedures. Uh, with no disrespect, but I don't think Mr. DeHaan can decide whether or not we can amend the bylaw. Would that be allowed, Madam Clerk? Uh, through you, Mr. Warden, I'm unclear on the question. I think what, uh, I can't see you, Councillor Warden, but you were just asking if the residents were offered um, the appeal process. I'm not sure if that was communicated with them, Ben. I know we, we had, uh, in, and I can think of them, and I'll defer to Trevor to kind of clarify uh, what, uh, what took place in the field, but I know certainly through our office, we had discussions with the agent associated with the one individual where the driveway was shrinking and, and, the, and, the, um, and uh, the, the, with the transport, and, and we, we provided the agent copies of the bylaw, had some good discussions about it. Uh, you know, did we, uh, in that circumstance, I, you know, I, I'll defer to Trevor to talk about what was discussed in the, in the field. Yeah, absolutely. Um, quite honestly, can't recall if I pointed the exact provision to that, that uh, individual I spoke to, but they were certainly informed there was, uh, this is council's bylaw, and if there's you know, change requested, council can make those changes. They were, they were advised that my answer wasn't the final answer, I, I guess. I, if I didn't tell them it was section 7G, 
uh, but they were aware there was a, a process available to them. Yeah, just for clarification, there's not really, an, and I, I don't think that you, you meant it that way anyway, uh, Councillor Warden, and I apologize if you did. I, it's not so much an amendment, it's, it's that there's an appeal process. That, that would be the information that they would have needed. They, they, they cannot amend the bylaw, but they can certainly appeal it. They can re request to appeal it, for sure, for sure. Um, okay, so at this point, then, we still have seven people who are in agreement with what Councillor McGillis has put on the table. Six, I don't know, are we changing our minds as we go? Okay, so I was in agreement as to how uh, Brian or Councillor McGillis had put in his demand. The only thing is any new culvert that were installed after 2017 had to abide by the bylaw. I don't see any relief that they would need to get. The unfortunate part is there's the three years, the people that, I'll use Chrysler as an example, that were frustrated and, and would not agree to do this, but I was presented from them with a PDF that gave all the provision, all the safety aspect, and the reasons why they basically just accepted that fact. There, that three years, those people did not, they wanted to have their existing culvert just like the old grandfather clause that we're talking about, but now we're putting them into the fact that, okay, it's a new culvert that we reinstalled. So a brand new culvert where there was a ditch and we're putting in a culvert, I agree. But for the ones that actually had a culvert been removed and replaced by the counties, they're in a league of their own. And again, they're, they're done, I, I agree with, but I have to make the comment that they were basically said, no, you can't do this. Three years later, it's like, okay, I guess we'll allow it. I don't know if anybody's following me or, or if I'm... So that's the, the, the only little clause is the people that said, all right, I guess we'll have to live with it. Uh, are being portrayed in that 2017 bylaw. So I don't know if there's a way. Uh, so I don't know if I fully support exactly what, the, or I'm just mucking it up, but uh, that's where I, where I stand. I'm, I'm using the three cases in Chrysler where they've basically agreed to it, it what's done, water's under the bridge, but yet now if we change it, say from 217, they're, they're being uh, outcast. Thank you. Well, there's no question that consistency is a casualty of this particular situation that we're in, but it is the council of the day's right, and and it falls under their their purvey to change things as they see wish or wish to see. It is how democracy works. It, there are probably multiple things that through all of our townships that people on Friday lived under a certain set of rules, and on Monday they lived under a different set of rules, and that's just the way democracy works. So, you know, it, it can be on the individual basis, much like having someone you want to fight for or, you know, make, let them have what they had before. It's the same as if you lose what you had before and that's the law of the day. That's just the way it works. There's no, they're not being ill-treated. It may be difficult on a one-on-one -on -one basis to, to discuss it with them, but they're not being ill-treated. That's the way democracy works. Councillor McGillis. Okay, thank you, Mr. Warden. I was trying to understand everything you were saying, Frank, or Francois. Um, <laughs> Councillor Laundry. Thank you. I'm, I'm more on an understanding. There's two things I want to raise here. Number one, we're change, we're, we actually are going to change this bylaw because we're going to add something to it, right? So this, the, date, the bylaw will start from the day that it's adopted. And that's how we can tell everyone else pre existing, other than what's happened in St. Andrews has to uh, live with what happened because we start, I agree with what you're saying, you can't start going back and, and um, you know, going back three years or anything like that. That's just a little bit ridiculous, I think, maybe. But another thing, too, there's a, something that's in the bylaw today, presently existing, is that the, the driveways that were more narrow, you brought them up to spec, and that should stay in there, too, as well. The ones that are unsafe, blah, 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 should be brought up to spec. And we did that in St. Andrews, and we, that was part of our meeting or negotiation discussion or whatever, and nobody complained about that. Am I correct? If you don't mind, through you. Uh, and my understanding is we're still going through that process to, to speak with all the individuals, but I, I, I think reasonably expect that that's, that's the direction they're going to want to go. Okay. That said, can I finish? 
so that the bylaw that we're going to come up with is the same as 2017, for, except for the fact, as uh, Councillor Councillor McDonald, not Jamie. <laughs> um, you know, he's, he, what he said made a lot of sense. He just re reiterated what I thought was the best thing, cut and dried. Just add that to the bylaw. The pre-existing driveways stay the same. That uh, you know, in terms of horseshoe, if you want to call it a circle driveway, and also the um, the wider driveway, and Mr. Burton shot that situation. So to me, it, it, like we're 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 com confusing things here today. It's so easy just to say this is how we're going to move forward. Existing pre-existing driveways, non-conforming, grandfathered. Anything after that is the new the new um, 2021 bylaw for entrances and driveways. Then does that make sense to you? It's it, it, I'll stop you there. It doesn't really, to be brutally honest with you, it, it doesn't really matter if it makes sense to you, Mr. Dahan. It's if, if it makes sense to the 11 people that are going to decide, and then you'll work within it. So I will direct that question to the table. Are we going to be okay with this? Because we could be here all day. Everybody's got a different scenario. Everybody's got whatever they want to add to it, with their brother-in-law, sister-in-law, whatever it is. So we need to get this wrapped up. Councillor Fraser, I will give you the last word, and then I'm going to ask for a consensus here. Thank you, Mr. Warden. And maybe the question, uh, maybe I could, uh, if, a question was, if the question was directed to me, if this makes, uh, makes sense, what uh, Councillor McGillis is uh, contending, that a new bylaw will be ena enacted, a bylaw will take effect, we'll have to backdate it to the start of construction in St. Andrews. If the question was, does that make sense to me? When we don't address the, one, the, the the residents in Chrysler, no, it does not make sense to me. Um, and uh, the the more and more this goes around, and the more permutations that we investigate and discuss, the more and more I think that the uh, the 2017 bylaw, as it stands, is the bylaw, and uh, I'm I'm in favor of that because that uh, seems quite clear, as I can tell by the consternation from many. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Okay. Can we get a show of hands again to see what was put on the table? By the way, this is not locking and this is not a vote. This is a committee of the whole, so this is just providing direction for, for Ben and Trevor, or Trevor to bring back. We will, thank God, have further discussions when we bring back the definitions so we can do this all again. Best day of my life, I don't know about you guys. But um, we can we can can we at least get that far because we've been almost two and a half hours on this and we're we seem to be at a, at a stalemate. So perhaps it would be prudent if we send them off with some information and they bring back something replete with definitions and we we discuss that again and see if we can finalize it because it does not appear, with no disrespect to anyone here, that we're getting any closer to finalizing it. So can we we? We wouldn't be voting on the issue. It's again, it's a it's a committee of the whole. We just provide direction to staff for them to bring something back that we can vote on at an actual meeting. Can we go that far and take 2017 or 1817 or whatever it was we were talking about to say that with the amendment that it is just going to be the same bylaw of 2017 with the addition of what was the wording again, Councillor McDonald? with pre-existing laneways. Can we take that as a stepping off point or we can stay here all day if you guys want to discuss it. But can, we, can we get a consensus on this? Can I get a show of hands that we can go that for, have them bring it back and we can discuss further? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, that's what we will do. I apologize to anybody who's biting their tongue and wants to have more discussion, but we do need to move on. Do you understand that direction? Okay, and please bring it back replete with definitions so that we can have a further fulsome discussion on it and make sure that we're okay going forward. Thank you everyone for the discussion points. We'll now move on to the SDNG administration building, the jail area. No, uh, Councillor Jorsky and I have to leave at two o'clock. There's a, we have an event to attend, so just want to let you know, we'll be leaving at two.
Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, so in terms of the uh, SDG, SDNG administration building, this is just really, a, I, I think, a quick report for Council. Uh, just in, with respect to some of the discussions we've previously had, I know uh, I had, there's, this is an example of, uh, of what I was expecting to have a long, uh, good, uh, fulsome discussion with Council about the jail area. So it excludes the, warden, the warden's house, but the jail area itself and what we want to do with that. Uh, the reality of, um, or actually the good news is that uh, economic Development and Tourism secured a grant, uh, so they've actually been able to pay for a jail feasibility study uh, to understand the successes and opportunity for the asset. Um, they've hired Lauren Christie Solutions uh, to lead the study, and it's going to consist of a uh, site visit, uh, which has happened, a scoping session, review of some materials, uh, an engagement with stakeholders, and supply and demand estimates, and some final reporting that Council can then chew on, because I think much, uh, you know, this is someone that is in the tourism industry and in, in an industry that would have a better understanding of what kind of opportunities exist there. Uh, all that being said, uh, Council is a key stakeholder in this discussion and um, the staff would, uh, for myself and, and Tara, and I'm, I'm, anyway, we'd like to get um, uh, Council's feedback on how you'd like to participate in this study. Uh, ultimately, my thought or suggestion is that in a future committee of the whole meeting, we have Mr. Christie attend, likely virtually, he's based out of the Toronto area, and then get some, uh, garner some feedback and discussion with Council. So I, I guess maybe I'll put it this way, if, if that sounds good to Council, um, I'm happy to take that direction and move forward, unless there's other alternative ways that Council would like to engage with Mr. Christie, and I'm happy to take those and, and try and work out a solution. Okay, uh, Councillor Williams, then Councillor Bivolds. Uh, thank you, Mr. Warden. I, I think this is excellent that we've got a third party in here to uh, to help disassemble what is a complicated little mess down there. Um, and 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 there is a huge uh, opportunity here. So, uh, but I do believe that council um, must be included in the um, in the discussion early on, and probably at the brainstorming stage. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bivolt. Thank you, Warden. So I'm, I'm a bit challenged. Like, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but a couple of months ago we were looking at the. And I'm, I'm first of all, I will pre preface and say the the old jail is something we need to keep and treasure and, and look after and study, and that's okay. The 1990 wing. The the opinion we were getting is the best thing we can do that is tear it off and get rid of it because it's just going to cost us money. Now we're going to have someone look at it. The biggest hazard in that is they're going to come up with this big, dreary, dreamy thing, and we're going to end up spending money on something we said two months ago we should have got rid of. So that's my challenge in that whole thing. Look at what we should keep, yes, but if we really think we want to spend money on something we wish we want to get rid of, then don't study too much. Yeah, and, and, and that's a great point, and I think that's why council needs to be engaged, because if that's the sentiment that, that is, I mean, ultimately, you, you folks are the decision makers on, on what and how and how much money we spend down there. So if that's the, and I think un, Mr. Christie, understanding that context from council will be very useful for, the, for this exercise. I, I would think that there is there's a, a world, to Councillor Bivald's point, there's a world of difference between asking someone what do I do to this building to get it back to what it was as opposed to what should I do with this building given the state that it's in? Is that closer to the question that you would like to see, Mr. Bibles? Because you're right. You can send someone in there saying, we have this jail. What can you do with it? Give me a big bag of money and I'll make it beautiful. Or I think it's in such disrepair. I'm not sure I would find it financially viable to go ahead and do that. Well, there's two different thoughts. If you have a designer consultant look at a building and look at it different than a civil engineer will look at it. Civil engineer looks at it and says, tear it down, don't even think about it. We have a building right now in South Dundas that if you put this kind of person in there, they'll think the world of it, and count, and, but we have to spend a million dollars to make that world work, whereas a civil engineer has told us three times the building should come down. And there's your challenge. Well, we, we live it every day in North Dundas because uh, there, you know, we have a building that I can't tell you how much it costs because we're not done. I'm not saying whether that's good or bad, but it's just, it's just the fact of what we, you know, because the question wasn't asked in a particular manner. Um, 
All right, what's council's thoughts to send Ben forward? Councilor McDonald. My mic on. Uh, I agree with uh, Councilor Bivelds. I just uh, I think we should look at uh, what what a civil engineer has said about a building because we we all have buildings that uh, are costing us a lot of money. I agree with keeping you know the main aspects of it, but if there is a portion that needs to come down, then we should get that before we get a designer looking at it. Yeah, we have. Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Warden. We have one too as well. Um, but ours is maybe a little bit different because we have a heritage status on it and the cost. It, there's three things we have to look at. What's the need of the building or is there a need? Uh, is it in a good location for that need? And um, what's it going to cost in terms of either tearing it down to, as opposed to upgrading it to the purpose where you want it? So there's a lot of variables there. We're going to, if we're going to spend a lot of money on a building we're not going to use or need, then it's not, there's, a, there's no big purpose to it. So I don't know. That'd be up to, it's up to staff to come up with a report and tell us what's the need for that particular building. Mr. Don? Yeah, no, I, and I guess to, to all of these points, I think if Mr. Christie hears that there's no desire to spend any kind of significant money there, we'll help to scope. He's not going to come back and say we need to convert it to a uh, uh, bed and breakfast or something. I, I, and I'm kind of throwing it out there. So I think him understanding what council's position is uh, kind of in a very holistic and very high level uh, perspective will help to scope what he's looking at and the kinds of things he's looking at. So I, I feel it's very useful to hear for him to hear this feedback from council. And, uh, and I think that that will help inform, you know, the feasibility of whatever, whatever he's looking at, because that's a, such a key driver in that feasibility. So from where I stand, this is a good process to go through because it does identify some opportunities. And, uh, and hopefully with the input we get from council in that regard, it keeps those opportunities and that scope grounded in reality. And then from there we can make, I mean, and even at that, we still have to make the decisions in terms of investment, if, if anything, because the, the suggestion might be, keep the historic jail, get rid of that jail, and create an art gallery. I don't know. Like, so that's the kind of thing that could come out of it, understanding where council stands on it. Councilor McGillis. That uh, jail has an historic value in terms of uh, under that group that makes the decision for you to allow you to, to do anything to that building or tear it down? Uh, there's nothing historic with the jail that's back here. Councilor Gardner. So my thought on this is yes, the consultant should come back. To preliminary, very. Pre I think it's from what I'm hearing, it would be very important for him to not get too in the weeds. He should kind of feel the flavor around the table and then start his um, investigation, if you will, about possibilities. Good enough. All right. We'll now move on to the warden with the method of election and term of office. The reason why I have that on here is fairly obvious to anyone who has watched what has happened this summer. It's it's uh, it's not a uh, not a secret or any deep thought. We should uh, we should do some housekeeping at the first part as to if we run into any sort of situation where a warden cannot fulfill their duties during the term that they are elected for, we won't be sitting or future councils won't be sitting at the table going, so what do we do now? I think it's prudent that we put forward however it is we want. You've got eight examples that were provided to you by the clerk. That would be the first issue. Also in sitting through that process that we went through, um, it's my belief and it could be soundly rejected by you um, that there was enough differing opinions of, as to what the warden should be, whether that's going back to how it was before the election process was put in forth or in any other iteration. This would be sort of the time to open it up. But I, I believe without a doubt that we should at least finalize how it is. We, we, perhaps we're just going to do what we did 
uh, through the process with Councillor Warden and have an election or whatever the will of the people is. Also, um, I would think that we do we do talk about the, the term and just, you know, it, it was surprising, I think, to all of us that there was no policy or, or procedure in place because goodness could be, God forbid, an accident or something could, could stop anyone from doing their place. So I think it falls to us to clean up this this little issue. So who would like to start? Councillor Bywilds. Thank you, Warden. I'm not going to pontificate on what I think where it should go. I'm just going to give Council a brief history of where it was and um, because uh, there's only two councillors here that uh, were here when this was changed back in 2013 in the intent of what was happening then. So as, as most councillors know, before 2010, there was a fairly un, unintended theme behind uh, electing the warden. The warden usually came from the county uh, on a rotation basis, uh, going from uh, Glengarry Storm on Dundas and then whipping back around. Um, most of the time, there was no uh, there was no warden that was uh, reelected. Uh, uh, I know that Warden Fife was reelected twice, but uh, that was the year that he, <clears throat> he was only the one eligible from Stormont County to be that warden uh, due to the election. Um, when I became warden in 2011, um, after being in about half a term, half that term, I, I thought it would be a good idea to at least look at a two-year term warden. Um, I did ask County Council at the time uh, to to uh, allow me to do so, and uh, um, there was not enough considerable votes or consensus at that time to do so. Um, however, I did say at the end of my term that we I would hope that we would look at least doing that. So it took two years after and we came up with this one plus one type term. Uh, it, we eliminated the, the deputy warden position. Um, uh, not sure if there was a real feeling why, but we didn't think, uh, the thought process was we didn't want the setup that uh, it should always be the per best person available. It shouldn't be wherever, you know, picking counties. And, and you know, I will, I'll say right now that <clears throat> if you think that going back to the, the county process, in, even if you make it intentional, it's the right thing to do, um, your challenge is no disrespect to anybody's hit this table, but if, if it goes into a process and all of a sudden it's this county's turn, and, and by the way, it was north-south, it flipped. That was a pretty normal flipping that happened. It only didn't happen when Estelle Rose was, became warden, because in theory it was uh, Rowdy Giller's turn to be warden, and he let it go to let Estelle have it. So North Dundas got it twice in the Dundas rotation, but that's how it flipped. Your challenge is, with that kind of thinking, you're gonna get around to the table and all of a sudden, you're that person's gonna be warden in two years. And you may cringe, but that's the way you've set it up. So I will, ha I will hazard you right now, don't think of that before you say, we're gonna do the Glengarry Dundas, or Glengarry Storm and Dundas, and then we're gonna go north-south. Because it may land up, you're gonna wish you didn't see that person there and you can't get them out. Um, the acting warden was more a ceremonial position. Uh, it was only if the warden couldn't go to, let's say, the event today, or you, let's say you're where there, and I actually did it for uh, <clears throat> Councilor McDonald when he was warden, that I went to an event in South Stormont, and he went to another event, and that's how you split it up. Um, because you, you can't be everywhere. You, you're not MP Duncan. You don't need to be everywhere. He has to be. Um, in the procedure bylaw still stated that the warden couldn't do their duties, council would duly elect the warden of that day. And, and that's how, even when I became warden that time when Warden Prevo wasn't here, um, the, the clerk of the day, uh, Thompson, made us do that. And we did it with, with uh, council warden at the time too. So that was the intent, there was no, 
there was no really no thought of what we really need to decide is how do we deal with situation of death, accident, resignation, forced out situation like we had this year. And we should have something in there. I, that we need to fix that hole somehow, some way. Not sure how we should do that, if we, but um, we could go back to Deputy Warren. I, I'm not saying we shouldn't, um, but you have to understand that once you make, it seems that that wasn't assumed. The Deputy Warden was elected in January of uh, the previous year and that person became the warden in the following year, uh, rightly or wrongly. So that was some of the history. I'm not going to sit here and, and you know, I'm, I want to open the plate up and allow this council to make decisions on this, but that's just some of the history that came out of previously. I became warden because Mr. Giller didn't get elected. It's the only reason I became warden. Do I say that's right or wrong? That's the way it happened. So. Well, I appreciate your permission to allow this council to decide how they'll collect the warden. Mr. McDonald, Councilor McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, I, I agree with uh, uh, Councilor Bivelds on the, the rotation. I, 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 don't, uh, I, I don't believe in it. Um, I think, again, the best person should be voted into the job. Um, I, I still like the, uh, the one-year term and that you will um, run for a second year. My only uh, change that I would like to see in that process is that um, I'm tired of looking Mickey Mouse and picking uh, a warden out of a hat. So my, my idea behind that is the immediate warden. So in this year, if we were to be voting, the immediate warden would not vote in the election. That way we have an uneven amount of people and if you want to run for a second term, you're going to make darn sure that you have enough vote around, enough support around the table and not just six people. So I think, I think that's probably the best way to get around it because uh, I, I felt so sorry for Helen. You know, it's like she's reaching in and she's pulling it out and she's like, uh, you know, and she's shaking and we just, it, you know, it, it's not fun to tell someone, yeah, I'm the new warden. Oh, yeah, you won. Yeah, I got my name picked out of a hat. So I, I look at that. Um, in, in terms of replacing a warden, I, I do like what Great County does. Um, I like that the immediate past warden would take over the chair only because uh, somebody's got to jump in, and I'm not saying that you haven't done a great job, and you have, um, is someone is up to date on all the files that were immediately passed in, in the past term. If it in, happens in the first term, then you automatically have to have an election because the immediate past warden may not be on council. So anyways, those are my two cents on everything. Okay, so if, if everyone is okay, that we can just attack that first question that I asked is, to, is everyone okay with that process if you've got your paper that tells, tells you what Gray does so that we could get encased in the, I guess, handful of times that this has happened throughout the history of United Counties that we we can at least put into place what we do if there's if there's a stoppage of service is anyone uh, is everyone okay with using gray counties I mean in my mind not that that matters but it's it just gives a process it doesn't have to be the ultimate best process but it's a process that goes somewhere else so at least that's taken care of Councillor Gardner I agree with that and I also uh, I hate the word optics but I think that with that, if the uh, warden not being able to fulfill duties is controversial, I think that steadiness of having a familiar, somebody that was recently in the role stepping in just kind of satis, like it, it just kind of kills it without the drama. So I, yeah, I think that's good. Thank you, three warden. Um, just one thing that wasn't clear for me in their process is this I think that that's reasonable to what, what Councillor Gardner was saying about having the steady hand and someone who's familiar with the files, but it's not clear for me how long is that term? Is that person just filling until the end of when the original term would have ended and then there's going to be an election? That's how their process works. Okay, so it could be... It, if it was six could months, could be four could months, be months, could be, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. In Gray County, the deputy warden is the immediate past warden. Duties commence in the absence of the warden and include chairing meetings, representing the warden at functions and signing time-sensitive documents. 
Warden term equals one year, but they may seek re-election. We would be discussing having the using the same parameters, except you would just be fulfilling the term of the warden that you're replacing. Councilor uh, Warden, Councilor Bybelt. I'm, I'm sorry, Councilor Ward. Yeah, I missed you. I'm sorry. Thank you. I just want to say I agree with what I've heard around the table, except for uh, I, I believe we should go back to the rotating. Uh, warden, at least uh, uh, the county of the day that uh, could be the warden should have the right to pass or uh, accept. And um, uh, because I, from what I've seen in my short term here, it's it's been a popularity contest. And I've seen deals made in hallways. I've heard deals made over speaker phones. I don't know if that's the proper way. I think we should, uh, you know, elect the best person for the job on the day if the, the job is open and not uh, over a couple of beers or uh, a, a promise I'll vote for you if you vote for me type of thing. I, I just, I'm not comfortable with that. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, for the first part, if we can just get to what we would do for the process that we went through now and then we'll go through the other things. So if we can keep our comments to that. Councilor Warden. Yeah, I'm, I, I like the Gray, the Gray County model um, and all the comments that Councilor McDonald said. Okay, can we have consensus on just that portion of it? Councillor Bywell's last comment. Just, just a comment, as the clerk's gonna need to know this, is that during election years, you may not have a deputy warden that was here, so you gotta have that little filler somehow in there, that's all, the rest mm -hmm. is okay. Okay, so we've crossed that off the list. The second, uh, if you want to take it, we'll take it in the term of the way it's written down. So, method of election is everyone in favor. I, I'm not that I'm ex to express my opinion, but I, I do concur with Councillor McDonald as far as the abominable sight of seeing someone pull a name out of a hat. If that, if there's nothing that makes this position negligible, it's pulling a name out of a hat. So the simplest uh, it, it is to simply not have the sitting warden not vote. Are we okay with that, or do you want to do something else? Okay. So we've got those two taken care of. Term of office. One year has been put on the table. Councillor Bywolds has expressed his concerns from 10 years ago that he would like to have two years, or do we do it one year and you can run for re-election? Councillor Smith, or Councillor Warden, and then Councillor Bywolds. Uh, I, I say status quo on that one year term, and if you want to run for two years, you've got to make sure you have your votes because you're not going to be voting. Councillor Bywolds. Uh, thank you, Warden. It's always one plus one. Uh, it was never guaranteed two years. One plus one. Thank you for the clarification. Is everyone okay with that? And the sitting warden will not vote. Okay, good. Now the 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 process. Do we go back to the to the way it was for what 150 years, or go through this process? Um, Again, the only thing that I would caution when I sit up here and listen, and I, I'm, I'm not speaking about myself or anyone else really, um, I find it a bit of an issue when someone's gonna sit at this table and say, boy, you better be careful about who you get for warden because I like chocolate, you like vanilla. You know, I mean, your choice of what's a solid warden is not necessarily my choice and so on. So for one individual to say, watch for who you get, well, that's there's no value to that because it's a consensus of people, right? Like we don't all like the same things and we don't all vote for the same people. So who would like to start as to how we're gonna go about doing this? Councillor Fraser and then Councillor Warden. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, I, I think everyone at this table um, has demonstrated an ability uh, and has been supported by their constituents to sit at this table, so I think we uh, are equals at this table. I think we all have an equal opportunity to speak. I think we all have uh, uh, minds that, uh, that work, that we can speak. Uh, we have established ourselves over the years to be able to be sitting at this table. So uh, the rotation is what I look at. But to uh, Councilor McDonald's point and the other, others that support that point about um, e electing the, um, the best person, well, if we're truly, thinking that we need to elect the best person for 
the position of warden, then we truly must believe that we need to have the best person. So the, the contention of one plus one or a two-year term really doesn't hold water because after having the best person on a one plus one or a two-year, however that works, then the next person we select isn't the best person. We've established that. If the best person was voted for that position to be warden, then we must continue down that path of having the best person in that position. So how could one person be the best person this year but not the best person next year? So I, I don't hold to that, that thought of that's the path we have to follow. I think the warden's position is one that should be rotated through the counties. I don't think it's so much a, 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 an issue that should be considered for the person, but it should be considered for the municipality. The municipality should have an opportunity to have representation at the head of the table on a rotating basis. It's, uh, it's not about the person. We're all well qualified to sit there. Uh, I, I, I don't begrudge anyone sitting there. It's the fact that some municipalities may not have an opportunity to sit at the head of the table for an extended period of time. Uh, based solely on, as some would say, a popularity contest or as an inability to uh, garner enough votes when they put their name forward. So I, I support the rotation to allow the municipalities to have an opportunity to have their representatives sit at the head of the table. Thank you. There certainly is some value to asking a question at least as to how is North Dundas the 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 arbiter to decide if North Stormont elected someone capable of being the warden. That's a, that's a question everyone should ponder. For instance, the people of North Stormont uh, decided that, that we have two members that are the best representatives of their community. Who are we to decide that they're not? That, that, that's certainly an interesting philosophical question. And sitting in this seat, to be honest with you folks, I, I question your ability to vote correctly, to be honest with you. so. All right, Councillor Warden. Uh, yeah, I, I, I like the current process. I think that uh, being elected warden by your peers uh, shows that you can uh, demonstrate that you can get the votes, and that's democracy. I mean, we all got elected to get at this table, and if you want to be at the head of it, you got to get elected. Um, I think uh, just because if you go to the rotation, I mean, I feel like you should be working, you should be earning the trust of this council and, and saying, I want to be warden and this is why you need to support me. If it's just on a rotational basis, you may end up with somebody that just wasn't designed to be in that position is not going to be successful. So I like the current status that we elect our, our representative every year. Thank you. Councillor Gardner, Councillor Jaworski, did you have your hand up? Yeah, okay. Councillor Jaworski, then Councillor Gardner. Thank you, through you, Warden. Um, so, when I, with my comments, I mean, it is important to underline that I do feel I'm newer to all of this, and so my perspective is different from everyone else's. And so, from my sort of more outsider perspective to it, one thing that I always had a challenge with is I, it did appear to me that the warden position was very ceremonial, and um, and now some of the things though that made it ceremonial seem to be perhaps going by the wayside with the issue of pulling out of a hat. And perhaps um, being more ceremonial was more reasonable two decades ago. But when I look at the files that are in front of us today, I feel that it is so important to have someone who is able to provide continuity and provide energy to those files. You know, there have been files that were a passion of wardens in the past, and then when the, the, the hat changed, the, the position changed to someone new, a lot of those strategic issues, in my perspective, felt by the wayside. And I think that that is really a loss for the entire region, that that happens. So I think it's important that it's not be rotational. Uh, I'm here by accident. Do I feel like I should be warden? No, because I don't think I have the best skill set to be that warden. So, um, but I do think there's other people around the table who, sh who do definitely have that skill set to advance those super important issues that the region requires. And um, to address a point that was made earlier that if someone's the best candidate for two years, are they not the best candidate the third? 
we're not static human beings. You know, some people, like example, maybe myself, maybe in a year from now, I feel like I could do that job, but now I feel like I am ready for it. But um, so, and, and some people who do it, then they start weighing in energy, and now it's time for someone new. So I think every election should be treated anew, and I think the policy should encourage consistency as much as possible. So I don't think necessarily that it should be a one plus one limit. I think if someone is a fantastic warden, I think they should be have that opportunity to continue if they are chosen by their peers. Thank you, Councillor Jaworski. I'm rest assured that you are a full and valued member. It doesn't matter how you arrived here. The fact is that there's, there's no, much like a golf uh, card, there's no still pictures on the, on the card. There's just a number and you have a seat and you are full and valued. Councillor Gardner. Uh, thanks, Warden. Yeah, I, I mean, when I look at this piece, um, somewhat new, like not as new as <laughs> someone new, um, you know, I look at, at pieces of equity and um, having the best person in the job. Um, I do not, uh, thanks to Councillor McDonald for those suggestions, because I, I think they were fabulous. I think that uh, to Councillor Jarowski's point, if we have someone that is dynamic, that is doing a fantastic job, obviously the, the second year, it really needs to be the person that takes that seat uh, seriously, um, that does a good job, that well represents. And I, I don't like the, the circulation of, you know, making sure every county's covered and stuff like that. Um, the only way I would agree to that actually is if we take the uh, south and west out of it and just do a three, Three section where you've got Stormont, Dundas, and, and Glengarry and rotate, so at least you've got four viable individuals that potentially we could vote on. But even then, I'm not, um, I'm not really convinced that that's the way to go. But uh, you know, I do did see it before I got here as a ceremonial uh, position. I know it's not. It's definitely what the person does with that position, and I think, I think the conversation. Beyond that, beyond this conversation today, should be that we want the person that is is going to make the most of that position follow those, you know, the files. It's not fair to have a file that is, you know, really uh, put in the forefront and championed for and whatever, and then the next person just kind of drops it. And I think uh, I think those are considerations that, aside from today's conversation, when we're selecting uh, folks to sit in in that chair, that uh, that's what we consider. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Warden. Well, I, I, I concur with my three colleagues over here and Councillor McDonald. Um, <laughs> that that's, that's a first. No, it's because I can't see him, so <laughs> it's hard when you can't see him. <laughs> Um, the, all those points that were made are precisely why I am running for the position of warden uh, for this coming year, because I believe I have a passion for the job, and I have things that I would like to support administration uh, in, in, in making happen. And I think that unless you go into that kind of job, which I agree is not ceremonial, I know that there is a great deal of work associated with it, that part of the job is, the, the main part of the job is, is leadership. It's in, and yes, it's chairing meetings, but then it's after chairing those meetings that you go and you find out, okay, what is the real work that is kind of ongoing that's being done by this organization, and how could I, as a leader, support that and help move it forward with advocacy and with uh, you know, broader support, getting out there in the community, knowing what's going on, and representing the counties on a broader level. So uh, I, I think just slotting somebody into that role just because it's their turn um, could potentially have a negative impact on, on, on what is really needed in that role and what should be demanded of that person in that role. Um, so that's why I think it's important that if, if somebody feels that they can do it, that they need to be able to stand up and say, I can do it and I will do it to my best of, of my ability. And again, it's democracy, so I, I believe that's the way it should 
it should work going forward. Thank you. Councilor McGillis. That's a nice, that was a nice little speech there. If, if, I, if, I didn't think. I didn't, I didn't think we were going to advocate for ourselves today. I thought we were doing it for the Well, reason. the last time there was an award and put up anyway, as well. Anyway, we're going to do that. I, 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 you are a good politician, I have to say that. But um, I, can, I understand and I agree with a lot of the things you said, uh, Councillor Williams, in terms of you know being passionate about the job, um, experienced, and wanting to do something as a leader of your community and all that stuff. It's great. I've done it. I've been there. and I was awarded in 2010. Um, everything went, I think I'm the one with the most experience sitting around this whole table, if I'm not mistaken. Jamie, you would know that more than Steve. I think I have the most uh, experience. Um, I, pardon? At the, around today at this building, yeah, as a counselor, yes. And um, I, pardon? Okay, I'm glad that you learned that. It's too bad you can't vote next time. <laughs> no. Anyway, I know I appreciate that too. Uh, it's it's great that we can all sit around and be serious, and then you know turn around and say a few things that's uh, that we have laughter to, and enjoy each other's company. But um, saying what I said, uh, you know, I have the experience too. I mean, uh, but I I'm going to go back to this something that uh, a few others didn't agree with. It was the rotation part of it. All these throughout the years, I've sat around listening to reasons why we should do this or why we should do that. And I did come to the conclusion that the best and the most fair way is to go by the, by the rotation because everybody sitting around this table, I've said it many times before, was elected by the people and they've done a great job electing a lot of people. I worked with a lot of fantastic people around this table and in our, my own council table tables throughout the years, different councils, um, are fully not only aware of knowing how to do a job like this, but uh, you know the confidence of the people too are there. So I think we should go and be fair and go by the rotation. We should, we pay a levy, Dundas pays a levy, South North, South North uh, Glengarry too as well. And you know, think of our municipal, our municipal staff and our municipality, or our, our councillors too. Like, why are they always skipping one municipality or one county? Why do they just keep jumping? And I agree, this is a popularity contest. You know, everybody's together, and if it's over beer, if it's over talking or me calling and uh, trying to solicit votes, I can do that too. But you know, I think they, yeah, I'd vote for the best person, but but. Be fair too. The person that's been here the longest, vote for the person that has the experience. I think that means a lot too. So, you put a good, uh, you weighed a lot of uh, good thoughts together there too, Karim. I'm not knocking anything you said down. I agree with everything you say, but I do have the same compassion and and uh, and skills to do the job too as well. So I, w I just want to say I wish you good luck. There's only two of us, and. Um, but need the best person to win, right? So, Thank number you. one, I said rotation. Number two, one year, one year to year. Can I just ask you for a clarification? Are you are you suggesting, or anyone who's suggesting that we change and go to a rotation, would it be your contention that we would do that now, or would it be? Uh, it, this is just a question. It, it, would it be? found to be more fair that everyone that's here was elected under the understanding that this was the process and we should make the recommendation and enact if I'm not saying we are but if we were to move to a rotation or to change the way in which the the warden is is put into place should we put it for the next term of council because everyone that came here came under a certain understanding of a set of rules and that's simply a question I have no opinion on that you saw he's asking me for I was asking you, Mark, because okay. you still have the floor. Um, I'll give that to uh, Councillor McDonald. He had something to say. I'm going to hear him out first. If you don't, if it's through you, just I, I thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, absolutely not. It's for the next term. 
we've already gone through a process uh, uh, that, we, that, that has a bylaw in, that says that we um, will uh, have people that express uh, expression of interest in September and then an election in October. Uh, there's, there's no way we can make that change now. Uh, this, is, this is what we were dealt for that term and it will be the same thing for the next council will be dealt out for the term. Okay, uh, can I answer the question now? Thank you, Councillor McGillis and Councillor Fraser. Um, you know what? I'm a fair person too, and uh, we have, we've had this will be the fourth uh, warden coming into uh, to the position of of uh, this county, uh, these the three United counties to do the job, and I agree. You know what? 100 percent. That uh, why change? I don't expect because that would be kind of slipping in and keeping karma out of the the um, you know the equation of having the opportunity to to be a warden if I said yes to this today. No, I say to start next term. Is that fair? Councilor Fraser. Thank you, Mr. Warden. And, and if, if I could indulge, if I could be indulged uh, with the opportunity to hear what Councilor McGillis says, he quite often turns away from the microphone and, and I can't hear him at this end of the table. But uh, just, uh, just for clarity, uh, and my apologies if anyone thought I was uh, suggesting that we uh, uh, my rotation comment meant an immediate change. Of, of course not. Uh, I, I fully understand how uh, procedure works. Uh, this would be something that, to the point that's been raised, and uh, it's, it was not my contention that uh, I changed the game midstream. Uh, the, uh, the current way we're doing things, uh, although uh, I contend we do something else, would definitely uh, be something for the next council that sits at this table after the, the election. It would not have anything to do with the uh, the upcoming election for Warden. Thank you. Councillor Bybos and, oh, Council, sorry, if I may, Councillor Bybos, Councillor Warden needs to leave in three minutes. Uh, thank you, Warden. I think the pressing issue of today is how do we deal with the challenge of, of the warden not being there? Like if Councillor Armstrong gets killed on the way home tonight, we have no way of fixing it again and we're back to where we were. Yeah, well, I just had to say it that way is that's the way you would say it. And, and, and anything we decide within the next little while is, is more a, a guidance tool for the next council. If they wanted to change it once they all got in, fair enough, but they have to have something to start with. That's it. All right, again, this is direction for, for staff and we would finalize this at the next meeting if, if council so chooses. So we will reiterate, we are going to, everyone, the, the direction is that we will be okay with no longer pulling out of a hat. If you seek a second term as, as a warden, you do not vote. We're good with that? Yeah, that's is that as warden. How didn't we get to six six then last time? Yeah, that's what that's what I'm saying. So if going forward, if you're running for a second term, is like if if I want to run again, I don't vote. Well, Frank voted. It was six to six. So we're changing. That's the change going forward. Yeah. 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 Right. I'm channeling my inner McGillis. Okay. So I'll have that. Right. The, the sitting warden will not vote. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah, no, that's great. Uh, so that's, we will have that going forward. It will be a one plus one term, yes. right? The maximum, there is no third term. Okay. We are going to now go to the, to the part is, uh, we are going to agree that we are going to continue under these auspices the way it is for the end of this term. Okay. Do we want to go back to the rotation for the following term? We get a show of hands. 
who, who would like to go back to the rotation for the following term, next county council term, would be the recommendation. Right, so that's. By choice, by boredom, by. You don't. You, you're not required to, but certainly it would be good for you to chime no. in. I don't mind. I can have my two cents. So this is uh, obviously uh, my first term. So uh, I'm not sure. I remember uh, where it used to be the rotation. Was there ever a vote or, or a change in the concept that we now go to elect, or did it just gradually happen? Councillor McDonald. So originally, it was. Your mic, please. It was an unwritten rule that the rotation happened. And that rotation continued until uh, Eric Duncan ran against me. And then the rotation went out the door after that. Then they made the change uh, to go to uh, an, elect an elected process. Right? So if, if I may add, uh, so I see benefits to both sides. So uh, talking about the rotation where you get divided evenly, where you get representation, we're all representing our residents. And to, if we look back at uh, uh, Mr. Prevo uh, being two terms with COVID and how we, we dealt with that, prior to that we had the Councillor McDonald, potentially Councillor Williams or so right now we're looking at four years of, of Glengarry so I can see the benefit of maybe is there more of a uh, touch and maybe before I know Eric Duncan was was on uh, with two years I'm just talking about having the residents get representation as as a warden throughout the counties to avoid so I understand the benefit of having for uh, the best man or women for the job but at the same time, we've all been elected. We've all have experience in different fields. You might be strong in one area. I'm strong in the other, that kind of stuff. So it's the one thing that I do see is the passion and the time. So myself, as you all know, I did not put my name forward. Presently, it's just my day job versus my, so I tend to my resident, but right now I couldn't commit to counties because of, of uh, time constraints. So uh, it leads to rotation, but at the same time, my rotation came my way. I would have to uh, pull myself back because of not being able to, uh, to commit that much. So I'm not sure that's where I stand. So maybe Mr. Wirt can. Uh... Councillor Wirt. Yeah, I'm a firm believer. Sorry, through you, Mr. Warden. Uh, I'm a firm believer that uh, the job is evolving, as Councillor Jaworski mentioned, and it's a big commitment to do it right. And consequently, I think that personally, I feel you have to have the best person out of the 12 in there. So much as I, both sides have merit, I do believe it's transformed from a ceremonial position now to one of advocacy, and uh, and it's a competitive game, and we need we need the best horse in the race. So that's that's my two cents. No perfect answer. Okay. So by show of hands, who uh, is advocating that we continue with the election process? Okay, that's that. Madam Clerk, you're clear on that. All right. So. Thank you, folks. I, the, the one last thing that I will, being me, that it takes to point out when we when we do throw around that it's the best person for the election, we did we did elect someone who said that they didn't get a a, a golf tournament and a, a a banquet. So we can ponder that and see how we define best. That's fine. Sure, sure. If that's the way you view it. So we have now, you guys, it's good. We don't need, unless you have anything else that you'd like to bring up or have tabled, because we're at the end of our... We, are you discussing the policy for COVID at all today? or I would like to, yes. Okay, as soon as possible. Right now. No, no, I'm saying get the policy as soon as possible so we can pass it. Okay, just so you, you, you folks know, because you have to leave, but... Um, 
uh, the, the hope would be that we can have a consensus here now. I think we've sort of gotten to it. When it is finalized, then we could have in the in-between time a half-hour Zoom meeting to pass this so that all local councils would have an understanding of what the county is going to do while you're leaving. Are you okay with that sort of thing? Yes. Councillor Bywell, do you have a comment? Uh, just comment, Mr. Warden, on, on our previous discussion. I hate to bring it up, but the acting warden position, maybe we need to clarify that and, and, that, and keep it as a ceremonial position only, and that way it's stated in the procedure bylaw. That, that, that I think, was an outstanding issue. I think it's appropriate, but with members leaving, we can pot that. that shouldn't take too long at our next meeting to just add that on so we don't, we don't delay these people. It will be something as well, perhaps in the future, if we have to have a meeting like this, um, either clear your schedule or, or let us know because we could have picked another, another day too if everybody needs to leave because these things do tend to take long and it's, you know, six or seven hours is not too much to ask. All right. Thank you. With all due respect, Mr. Warden, it's, we're raising a flag for the awareness. No, I, I, no and I get there, but that's why I said we yeah, would change. Sorry. I would actually have worked to change the date, you know, if we would know. would want to accommodate everybody, absolutely, to make sure that everybody's still here. Thanks. Okay. If we could have uh, CAO Simpson, do you want to discuss where we're at with the, with the uh, vaccine policy? Good afternoon, everybody. It's been a long, uh, long morning. I won't uh, be too long. I've been speaking with uh, the warden about this, as as well as all your your local CAOs. We've pulled together a draft as a group, uh, myself, Catherine, and uh, and your local staff. And what's happening right now? Alan White's taking a look at it uh, for just to make sure that it's it is where it needs to be. I'm expecting, uh, and Debbie uh, Lucas Switzer from uh, South Stormont's taking the lead on that, liaising with um, with Alan. I expect to see his stuff in the next day or two. So to the warden's point, what we probably can do is pull together. I'm guessing next week if people are available. Uh, the morning seems to work well. I I, I don't want to, or maybe in the evening. Whatever works, uh, have to, you know, have a half-hour uh, meeting where we can review the policy and pass it. Um, but what we'll do, as soon as I get the the tweaked version back from South Stormont, I'll we'll circulate it around so everybody has it. If you have any comments, um, please let us know, and we'll make some changes. It's it and it's it's been developed along the lines of what we talked about at our, at our last meeting. So that's uh, moving forward. And I know a lot of your local municipalities are moving forward as well. I do I do note that uh, I believe the city passed one. Their policy last night i think i saw that so again there's is they're all they're all very similar um uh you know the basic tenants are the same so once i get it we'll circulate it then we can set up a meeting to uh, to deal with it everyone's good with that hopefully early next week okay madam clerk the adjournment resolution is moved by councillor fraser seconded by councillor gardner that the committee adjourn to the call of the chair. All in favor? Thank you, folks.